Uh, halftime show. Welcome in on your. Oh. There we go. Welcome in. It is the halftime show. Tyler Head along with you here on this Wednesday afternoon now. Terry Ford. He's out in the bullpen. Like, like he'll be in here in like, I think, two minutes. So, again, to the folks that place bets on how late Terry will be, it won't be very long today. So, place your bets on a very low number between one and two minutes as uh, he will uh, jump in here with me. As we got a lot to talk about today. Of course, the news of the morning, the buzz of the entire day revolving around Cam Scott committing to South Carolina and doing so right here in the Hearn Chevrolet Studios was on with Bill Gunter this morning in the 8 o'clock hour. I feel like we did a pretty good job of keeping a secret. Some people are not good at keeping secrets, and we teased all afternoon long and all day long yesterday, hey, big announcement coming up today at 8 o'clock, big announcement coming up today at 8 o'clock. And inevitably, when you have enough people in on something like that, somebody's going to blab and the word's going to get out. I think, Terry, we did a very good job of keeping our lips sealed on this one. I'll say this. Not only did we, but Cam Scott and his crew did a great job. Yep. I mean, everybody did a really nice job of sh And in this day and age, that's a miracle. Now, there was a lot of speculation, of course, because Cam Scott got released from his national letter of intent from mm -hmm. Texas a couple days ago. Right. And, you know, even said in his little um, spiel about, you know, decommitting from Texas, hey, I want to play closer to home. So there's a wink, wink, nudge, nudge of what mm -hmm. that decision might be. But. Yes, we officially got the confirmation this morning he is going to be a Gamecock. And there, and there were people like, obviously, you know, because that's the world we live in on social media, you know, thinking, okay, this, you know, he's going to he's going to South Carolina or the big announcement could be yeah. uh, Cam Scott, you know, going to South Carolina. So there were people who were trying to guess, but the, the folks in the know who knew yes. didn't say anything. And Cam Scott, even on his, like, uh, Twitter feed, just had the little hourglass. Yeah. That was it. Nothing well, else. It, and it's so funny now in today's world of social media how much can be given away mm -hmm. by what you do on, like, Twitter where you'll see a guy Absolutely. like, okay, where is he going to go? Well, he was he liked these three tweets by a fan of Texas <laughs> right. last weekend, so uh, he might be leaning towards Texas. I don't really know. Like, it's crazy how those things can be a giveaway that the recruits themselves probably aren't even thinking of. But, again, you have these people that are – paying attention to everything that you do and mm -hmm. any inkling of leaning one way or the other they're going to run with it oh yeah i mean there's people who look at flight patterns man hey we've all done that okay <laughs> there's people look we're at not flight proud patterns. of it but flight aware is a very helpful yes. website it's it, it's just hilarious so you're right everybody's looking for some any little nugget piece breadcrumb whatever to let well, them know what's up well you know his next door neighbors mother's best friends cousins sisters grandfather's best friend's neighbor went to South Carolina, so there's a very good chance he could go to. You know, his dog has a garnet and black collar. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just people are, they it's because that's what it is, because they, they love their favorite uh, team, and they're just <laughs> hoping. There, there's a picture of him from when he was five at a chicken farm, so clearly <laughs> it's Gamecock's right. on the mind, right? Yeah, so again, it was, it was fun today to do, because really those kind of things are so rare now. Sure. Because of social media, a lot of, a lot of, uh, recruits will just do it on their social media or they'll go to the school and do it hat dance yes which you know is always funny to me i just it's entertaining to me probably in ways it shouldn't be entertaining to me but it always so, is when i see the 50 hats in front of somebody so here's the trick to that we'll look at which hat looks the newest on the table that's the school he's not going to be picking because <laughs> that usually means they ran out the night before uh -huh. and grabbed all right they went to walmart and they got the hat of the school that he's not going to it still looks pristine mm -hmm. probably still has a sticker on it if they have that hat on the table they're not going there it's like Shh, hey we forgot to get we forgot to get the one hat. Yeah. Oh, we forgot to get the one hat. Quick, go get the one hat. Exactly. Yeah. Or if that one is like, you know, looks like it just came from like, you know, the uh, like Dollar Tree. Exactly. And the rest of them yeah. are all real nice. Like, yeah. uh, you know, you got like the Under Armour South Carolina <laughs> hat. You got like a, a Tennessee uh, Nike hat or whatever it is. And then you got the, I don't know, Champ Sports <laughs> The Russell Texas Athletic, hat, Russell Athletic Texas hat that, you know, like the orange isn't even right or something like that. They spelled Texas wrong. Exactly, like the horns are down. <laughs> so, yeah, it was fun today. Because of that, you don't typically have these announcements done like maybe the old school traditional way where somebody would go on the TV station or go on the radio station and do it. So, it, 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 and we do, we appreciate, you know, Cam and his high school coach and his family and everybody who's involved and, you know, Getting that done with us, and obviously 
Bill Gunner went to Lexington. I say, Another Lexington we, High School legend. We appreciate the fact that Cam Scott sat in here, let Bill gloat about himself <laughs> for an hour. You know, when I was at Lexington. Uh, uh, enough about you. Let's get back to my career at Lexington but, High School. By, by the way, Elijah and I have figured out that uh, he, he probably did hear about Gunter because the, the list of kids that get cut from the basketball team, they call that the Gunter list. <laughs> and the last spot for the guy on the bench, they call it the Gunter seat. So that's probably where Cam Scott's heard well, of him. You know, some schools, like, certain players wear a number because it means something. Sure. Right? Sure. And would it be you would wear Bill's number if you were the last guy on the bench at Lexington? You know, instead of, like, getting assigned the honorary number, like number seven at LSU, they always give to, like, the best player on the team, mm-hmm. you know, the Honey Badger and guys like that. Mm-hmm. It's like you don't want the Gunter number. <laughs> I don't that know. You ain't I, got, I got the Gunter. If you get that, you know what it means. Yeah, you just don't even put your gear on under your warm ups. Hey, he came off the bench for two minutes he in the did. state championship. He did. And he, you know, his two minutes were quite vital, to be he, fair. He just ha- ask him. He has a state championship ring just like Cam Scott, but Cam <laughs> worked a whole lot harder for his. Did, didn't Bill bring that up today with him he about did. when He's I got, like, I got yeah, a championship ring? I got a ring championship like ring. You. I came off the bench in the final two minutes. <laughs> One of these is not like the other. <laughs> oh, man. So, yeah, we do. We appreciate it. Seriously, you know, Bill Bill was part of getting that together because of his alma mater and, you know, and his relationships there. So we give, we, we look, we give Bill grief, but we give him a ton of props. Um, Bill again, opens himself up to grief. Yeah. Well, well he really, he's kind of, yeah. yeah. But, hey, the promo says the best. I love me some me. Yeah. <laughs> It was fun today, and Cam stayed the whole hour, and, yeah. you know, it was good. And we, you know, actually got it out there on the video. It's true, we hit the right cameras for the most part. We got that going, and a lot of social media love on it. So we want to thank uh, Cam and his folks and everybody involved and, you know, our buddy Bill and everybody. It was just it was a really cool thing today for us to be part of. And we were just part of, yeah. you know, Cam Scott making a very important announcement in his life. And while we're sitting here doing all the radio stuff and the programming stuff and the producing oh. stuff, we got to stop and understand this is a big moment in this kid's life that it, he's going to announce he's going to play at his hometown school. It, it absolutely is. And, again, he's from right up the road in Lexington. I, I, they were a couple minutes late because they got caught in traffic, probably the same traffic I was, I was getting caught say, in You live that traffic every day, well, man. That, that's <laughs> the thing. And, and, and Bill said Lexington going into the top of the hour, which I hope wasn't too much of a giveaway, but I was thinking, I'm like, yeah, they're probably like three cars ahead of me right now. Well, the, the funniest part is the minute he said Lexington at the top of the yeah. hour, 8 like, o'clock, uh, Jen looked at me and she goes, he just can't help himself. He, can't. he really can't. <laughs> he was doing so well the whole time. And, and Bill, wasn't, he wasn't giving anything away. And then, then he said Lexington. They're coming from Lexington. And we just looked at each other and, and we just started laughing. We're like, well... He held on till the end. <laughs> At that point in time, people are already listening. So <laughs> Yeah, so it's all good. And it was it was. And that's the one thing we just we can't forget that that's a moment, right? Yeah. His parents are here. And look, everybody is hoping for bigger and brighter and better things for a Cam Scott. Hopefully he comes in, he balls out, he helps South Carolina have a great year. He has a great year. And you hear his name in the NBA draft lottery. Right. And he goes on and has a wonderful pro career. And this was just a, a moment along the way. But it's a moment. It's a big moment at this point in in Cam Scott's life. And we're just honestly we appreciate them letting us letting us share in it. And, sure. and that's really it, that's what meant the most to us is we get to share in a moment that really matters for a family as they move forward. And again, we, we thank them for letting us uh, eavesdrop, so to speak. And it was funny. I think Lamont Paris's uh, uh, girlfriend or whatever is on uh, Twitter or social media. OK. And she put up a thing like, I can't believe I'm actually on YouTube watching a radio station. <laughs> We appreciate you for doing that. (laughs) Thank you very much. All right. And and there's a lot of other things we're going to look at in this Cam Scott uh, story and topic because it goes, you know, bigger than the announcement today. This is just step one for Cam Scott. And we're going to get more into that. And what does it mean for, obviously, Cam Scott, the South Carolina basketball program with Lamont and all these other things. So we got a lot. We got a few different roads to, to plow on this. Uh, with Cam Scott. And Texas still has a highly thought of recruiting class that they're bringing in. So it's not like Cam Scott cratered the Texas recruiting class by deciding you wanted to play at South Carolina. And it just, so we got a lot to get to on this story. We certainly do. And there is the added bonus now of your taking a commitment away from 
a conference opponent now because mm-hmm. yep. Texas is coming to the SEC and Cam Scott would have been hurting you on the other side of things if he stayed at Texas. Now he's in, on your team and you're taking that away from Texas. Yeah, and, and, and just, it could be just as simple as Cam Scott looked around and said, you know what, I'd like to play close to home. Obviously, there's always that NIL piece we don't know anything about that's always floating in the ether that we run through our head. But, you know, just for the idea, we know he wants to play closer to home. I mean, how much of Texas underachieving last year with Rodney Terry's first full season and watching South Carolina shock the basketball world, Mm -hmm. how much of that also comes into factor where it's like, you know, I would have liked to play close to home in the first place, but now playing close to home, I'm playing for a team that made the NCAA tournament and their coach was really legitimate, could have been coach of the year nationally. Texas, well, it didn't go as well as everybody was hoping. So maybe, you know, it's in my best interest for a lot of reasons to go play at home. Sure. So, I mean, if South Carolina goes 12 and 20, we're probably not having the announcement this morning. Probably not. Um, I mean, we don't know that for sure, but I think the momentum that Lamont Paris has gained off of the season that they had did not hurt let's put it that way no absolutely and i think everybody really buys into what lamont paris has done and again shocked the entire world outside of the little bubble here in columbia with what they were able to do here and even most of us were pretty surprised by that i was gonna say i was gonna say shocked also the the folks here in the little bubble and and look they'll say this it, it, it has to be this way you have to you have to be part of that program as a player coach head coach support staff you have to believe Sure. It can't be lip service. You truly sure. have to believe that all well, this, you're going to get picked, you know, 14th in the SEC. Oh, hey, maybe if they can win five SEC games, ooh, yeah. maybe six. Hey, you know, if they don't get blown out by the by the uh, upper echelon, yeah. they, you well, have to believe all that. Nobody yeah. knows but you what you got, and, right? And I go back to Chris and I's conversation with Jacoby Wright yesterday in the Garnet Trust Hour where, of course, he was here with Frank Martin. Like, mm-hmm. he saw the transition from Martin to Lamont Paris as head coach. And, again, he didn't know Lamont Paris before he got here. He went back and obviously went over his accolades this time at Chattanooga and everything. But, you know, he knew even during that first year where they struggled and were losing more games mm-hmm. than they were winning, this guy's a good coach. When he gets the guys that he needs in here, we're going to be successful, and it's exactly what we saw this year. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing, you got to believe when you're there. you got to have the belief that what you're doing is going to be successful, not just belief in your coach, but your teammates and everybody that's part of the program. Hey, all that noise outside, they don't know what we're doing here. Right. And I think all that momentum of what you saw last year helps to get a Cam Scott to stay. Remember, the G.G. Jackson thing didn't go very well. No, it didn't. Let's just be honest here. We talked about it at the time. It was a marriage of convenience. And, you know, G.G. needed a landing spot to reclassify so you can go to the NBA draft. South Carolina needed players. And when you got a recruit that highly thought of and he wants to come play ball for you, you're going to take them. Yeah. And it just, it, it was it was clunky through the whole process. So how? So then your thought is, well, you're not getting a Cam Scott because obviously the GG thing didn't go very well. You didn't have a very good season. Nobody's got a lot of expectations for you in 2023-24. And then guess what? Uh, mic drop. Well, and, <laughs> Boom. And this past year, and we talked about this in the last hour, that yes, he technically wrapped up his high school career in Utah, but CMB is another local kid. Mm-hmm. Alex had a local kid at that. He was able to come in, make an immediate impact, became one of the key players of this team as the season went along. So you look at that as a guy that's going to be coming in as a true freshman saying, hey, I can do that. I can slide into one of these roles. Maybe the Michi Johnson role that's now been left wide open, mm-hmm. that Cam Scott can come in and be that solid contributor yep. at that two-guard spot. Yeah, I mean, so we got a lot to look at with this. We'll get back to it and, and discuss some things with uh, Cam Scott. If you missed it earlier, Cam Scott, uh, five-star uh, recruit, has decided to play his college basketball at South Carolina for Lamont Paris. And if you missed it, we'll have it up on our game TV site. If you can, you can watch the whole hour, we're working on it. We'll get it up there. Also, you can see a lot of stuff on social media about it as well. So, Cam Scott playing his basketball, however long that is, at the University of South Carolina. We'll come back and continue that conversation. Terry Ford, Tyler Head, it's a halftime show. Till three on the game.
Uh, good morning, everybody. It's Cam Scott here from Lexington, and I'm proud to announce that I am now a Carolina Gamecock, and we'll be joining the Gamecocks men's basketball team for the next year. I'm uh, very excited. Uh, thank you for having me, and you know I'm just looking forward to making big things happen here in the SEC. So yeah, spurs up, go cock. Here we go. That was Cam Scott. That was the opening of Cam <laughs> Scott's uh, hour or uh, 50 minutes, roughly here uh, on the game this morning in Columbia, Florence, and Myrtle Beach. We appreciate you checking it out, whether it was on game TV, whether you were just listening, you're on the app, you were doing whatever you were doing. We appreciate it as uh, it was a cool part of our morning here. Absolutely. Oh, uh, he, he, is, he is every bit of six foot five. I can confirm that. <laughs> yeah, I think he's a solid. A lot of times these guys are listed at six five. They're really six three. Yeah. yeah, he's he's close to the real deal well, at six five. There. So, yeah. so so here's the thing: when you're like a high school, even in college, because we were talking about this with, uh, or I heard Jane Elijah talk about this with uh, A. Xavier Leggett, that he's actually like six foot one, not six foot three. Mm-hmm. That you can fudge the numbers a little bit, mm-hmm. but when you actually get to like the professional levels and like the league itself is the one measuring you and weighing you, yep. those numbers are more official. But yes, Cam Scott, it looks very much six. He looks six five. Yeah, Jacoby Wright looked about six two. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm I'm about I'm about six one. Right. So I was like, yeah, okay, his height. Because I do I look at that with the especially basketball players. Oh, totally. Because when they come in and you sit there and go, yeah, uh, all right, six, yeah. six foot seven. I don't know about I'm that. I'm going more six five yeah. than a six seven. But now when you're wearing the shoes, sure. But you're not allowed to do that when they. <laughs> but but that's things like shouldn't you. Shouldn't that count for something? Because you're playing the shoes. You're playing in the shoes like you're playing weight in football. You're going to be wearing helmets and a shoulder Here's my pad. Question. Shouldn't well, that count too? You're, you're you're going on an interesting road. Should you weigh them in total gear and not in their underwear on a Toledo scale on a stage at the combine? Because I won't lie to you, it's a little weird. Well, well he, here's the thing: like they are truly in their underwear when they That's weigh them. That's what I'm saying. It's a little he, weird. Not even like the, you know, the the whatever you call it, the thin material bike shorts or whatever that they wear. Mm-hmm. Um, they won't get true reading, I guess. Yeah, uh, but. I think you make a legit point of, wait a minute, you don't play in your underwear. You play in and, and you're running around in that gear. <laughs> Football would be a whole lot less popular <laughs> if they did. 22 dudes in their underwear running around, just, ah, uh, yeah. Probably not. Yeah. You just creeped everybody out. Nice work. Good job by oh, you. I could see Jay's skin crawling if he <laughs> were here for that. <laughs> no doubt. So Jay, Jay is uh, 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 very put off by any kind of, bodily things it seems like well, especially if anything dave says like that oh yeah and now the 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 promo you guys used to run about having his chest signed yeah <laughs> jay, jay didn't do that for radio effect jay was yeah, truly jay, jay very much is is creeped out by this yeah, jay's of eyes burned was just the thought of that so yeah 22 guys play football in their underwear jay wouldn't watch no doubt but speaking of jay before i forget he is going to be hanging around He's at Hilton Head, hanging around the old uh, Heritage. We'll hear from him today. He'll be out there, I guess, sort of kind of covering the Heritage for us. Sort of, kind of. Sort of, kind of covering the Heritage for us. And he'll be on from Hilton Head at the Heritage. And, of course, Elijah will be here in the studio for the uh, postgame show. And hopefully, Jay's going to have some good guests for today. So we'll find that out. All right. Um, back to the Cam Scott. And we touched on it briefly. First of all, what does it do for the South Carolina basketball program? It just keeps the positive momentum going. Because Lamont, if you look at, if, let's just take a take a thought about it. Cam Scott, Gigi Jackson, Colin Murray Boyles. Colin Murray Boyles was a top sixty recruit coming out of high school. Yep. Cam Scott's a top forty. Gigi obviously, you know, was a was the highest level of the three. You're doing pretty good holding on to your in-state talent. At this point. And, and a state that is very rich in talent. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, it doesn't get talked about as some of the other states, but look at the guys in the league. Zion, John ja Morant, obviously, you know, Gigi Jackson's there now. Like, great talent comes from this state. And if you can keep that talent in-house here, then you're going to have a good program. Yeah, and I just think that's, that momentum is heading in such, such a great direction for Lamont. First of all, the season you had, which leads to these doors opening. Like, look, last year, look, let's be honest. When you're seeing the names coming through the transfer portal, you're not going, wow. You're just not. Sure. I mean, and this isn't anything against anyone, you know, nothing against Cooper or Mackey or Studi or any of those guys. 
I mean, were they better? Were they better than the year before with what you brought through? Yes. The the, the Studi one is probably the one that popped out the most to me because obviously we're most familiar with him playing at Vanderbilt, mm-hmm. and we knew his ability to shoot from the outside. Like I think that drummed up some interest, but and, and people looked at okay, BJ Mack, all right, Wofford, uh, okay, Talon Cooper, Minnesota, yeah, it's, it's at least a power conference, but mm-hmm. um, you know, outside of the veteran experience, I don't think anybody was overly excited about that, and obviously those guys came in and all played phenomenally and were a, a huge part in their own ways of why this team was so successful. So it's one of those things that, like, and again, coming off the bad season that the year one was on Lamont Paris, we hadn't learned to trust him yet no, because we would not been, been seeing point. the indications too. But now you're saying, okay, so if he goes out there and pulls a guy from, I don't know, Northern Colorado, let's just go like the Dalton <laughs> Kinnett example. If he pulls a guy from Northern Colorado, we're going to like, all right, there's something about this guy. We don't know what it is, but Lamont Pierce sees mm-hmm. something, and he's going to get the benefit of the doubt because of that. Yeah, for me, when, I, the, the, when I'm seeing the names, obviously, yes, we've seen Miles Studi play, and once I read on Talon Cooper and saw his numbers, I was like, oh, a pass-first point guard. Thank God, because I love pass-first point guards, because sure. that's what a point guard should be. And, and then when he has the opportunity to score, he can score. That's really what Cooper was this past year. Right. Pass-first point guard, but when it was his time to take a shot, he made he made a good amount of very important buckets. Studi, you knew she hit threes, and that was a good thing. Mackey was going to be an unknown coming from Wofford. But, yeah, you didn't sit there and go, wow. None of these guys are like top 10 portal guys or top 15 portal guys from the rankings and all that stuff. But what you saw was Lamont knowing what he needed, knowing, you know, what he also needed for what the systems he wanted to run and the kind of culture he wanted to build. And that was last year. Now, this year... He's going to get a bigger pool to choose from because players want to go play where you can win. And what South Carolina did last year, all of a sudden players go, hmm, interesting. What's this dude doing in Columbia, South Carolina? I'm interested in talking to him about possibly playing there. So your pool of, of transfer portal guys gets bigger. Your pool of high school recruits get bigger because everybody wants to go play for a winner and someone that can get you to the next level of your profession. And, again, it's early for Lamont in that NBA thing. I mean, Gigi was a second-round pick. But with all the injuries in Memphis, Gigi started running and had a better year than probably anybody thought because most figured he'd be in the G League most of the year. And he averaged double digits. So this is nothing but great momentum. And this adds to the portal because then, you know, guys in the portal go, huh, wow, okay, I I, I got to – you know, South Carolina's got to be in my conversation. All of this is just continuing some great forward momentum. Yeah, absolutely. And, look, they're still going to address, you know, a couple of holes there in the portal. You're probably going to try and go out and find somebody. Probably not going to be able to find somebody as experienced as Talon Cooper, but pr- try and find that pass first type point That's guard. That's number like one to about. me. That's the number one objective number because, one. again, that made a night and day difference from what you had a season ago with kind of assigning that role to different people. Um, Talon Cooper was it was so integral in, in running this offense. If you can find that guy or somebody close to that guy out there in the transfer portal this offseason, that would be a big part of this team being successful. Obviously, you're going to have Sudi returning. You're going to have Jacoby Wright come back for another year. you got a lot of pieces that are still here. And uh, then, again, you can slide Cam Johnson maybe into that role that Michi Johnson left behind. And you need a five, you need a center. You need a five that's a rim protector, an athletic rim protector, an enforcer in the paint, and a dude that either is a rim runner for pick and roll dunks or a guy you get the ball to him, he can complete plays. But his the center they need, in my opinion, I don't care about points per game as much. Mm-hmm. I care about rebounds per game. Can you block shots? Can you alter shots? Can you be a defensive enforcer? If you can find that guy and he's got – you want athleticism in that spot. Sure. Because you need a dude – I mean, just w- watch athletic fives defensively. They change the game in a lot of ways because you, know, you might they, know, they might not block your shot, but they're altering your shot. You're thinking twice about going at them, right? Sure. So that, those are the two biggest needs of me, a pass-first point guard who's a veteran and a real center – who can do some things for you defensively and who's athletic. Right. That's where I'm at with what's left of. And if you want to bring in another perimeter player because you did lose Michi and you want some insurance just in case, that's that's not a bad thing either. All right, we'll get back in here. Hey, we've got a spring game Saturday. Shane Beamer talked yesterday. We played some of it. We'll get you a little bit more Shane Beamer sound as well as we keep cooking on the halftime show. Terry Ford Tyler had rolling until three on the game.
Halftime show with Terry Ford and Tyler had on the game. Obviously, a couple big stories were hitting. Cam Scott on these airwaves and on our uh, video stream uh, announced that he was going to be uh, playing his college basketball for okay. Lamont Paris in South Carolina. By the way, any other local high-level recruits, if you want to make your commitments here, we are game for it. We're good. And by the way, we keep secrets. That's right. Hey, we're so, good at that. Hey, let us know. We'll, we'll hook you up. You can sit with Bill, and Bill will tell you about, you know, his championship ring. It'll be fun. I'm sure they have his jersey up in the rafters, <laughs> right next to Cam Scott's. All right, so Cam Scott today announced he's going to play at South Carolina. we got the spring game, get some Shane Beamer sound here in just a minute. First, let's roll off 803-404-6100. Our buddy Ray, thanks for holding on, Ray. You're on the halftime show. How you doing, my friend? Hey, hey, gentlemen. Hey, yeah, I, man, you guys hit it, man. You were talking earlier. You know, just in the two to three years that, you know, I guess Lamont's been recruiting. And I, I know that uh, Big Frank had a little bit to do with Gigi. But, hey, let's give Lamont his credit on this one. So, just in the last two to three years, we're talking Gigi, CMB, and now uh, Cam Scott. I mean, the caliber of these players, and I was looking back, and, I, and I've been going to games, Terry, since uh, the days of Brian Winters. I mean, you know, I was, you know, I was like a, t- I was like a ten year old kid, but <laughs> I remember that. And, and honest to God, and I, and, and and what's amazing about that, that was a Nixon administration, and we made this NCAA tournament. Uh, we won a game in the NCAA tournament that year in '73. We didn't win another game of basketball in the NCAA tournament until Frank took us to the, uh, to the uh, well, Final Four, what, five or six years ago. But anyway, so I was looking at the caliber of these three players, and. If we, and if we go back prior to Gigi, if we go back almost 50 years, I can only think of three McDonald All-Americans in that prior 50 years. You know, that's, of course, P.J. Mackey, Roe Howe, the late great Roe Howe. And I think when Alex English came in at 73, I, I'm thinking maybe that's the first year they did the McDonald's All-American, or maybe they didn't. But So anyway, let's just say it seems like the recruiting of players, whether it's from high school or portals or whatever, Man, it's just it's just improved tenfold. I mean, it's it's it gives a lot of excitement for the future. Uh, I agree. I, it, it just feels like the momentum's just rolling. And Ray, always good hearing from you. Appreciate it. I like the fact he had a memory of play, watching Brian Winters when he was two. Yeah, that that's uh, that's a good memory. Remember right anything there. from when you were that little? Uh, I do not. Uh, 1998. No, I don't. You got nothing. Nope. I can't remember anything from last week. I think my first memories are like. That's when I was like four. I was playing like uh, T ball. That would have been 2000. I do remember hitting my first home run. Really? Yeah. I remember I was playing baseball in our backyard, and my dad had been in a car accident. And back in those days, for some reason, they brought the wrecked car back to your house. I, I don't know sure. why, but All they right. did. So we got this total wrecked car sitting in the driveway. I remember my dad, Dean Ford, like, boy, I was, I was geez, four, maybe yeah. three or four. Boy, don't go into that car. It's dangerous. So, of course, I'm playing wiffle ball or whatever I was, and my ball went under the car. So I go to crawl under the car to get it. I'm getting ready to reach for the car, and I feel these hands grab my feet and flip me upside down on their shoulder. And I'm hearing this, boy, I told you not to go under that car. And then I got the, the, the whop on the butt for every step, every word. I told you not to get under that car. So one of my early memories is getting my butt whipped by my dad for going under a car. What would you learn that day? <laughs> Not to go under the car ever again. I won't go under a car today. Really? Okay. Thinking that my dad's going to pull my feet out from under me and whip my butt. That's funny. But anyway, I mean, th- that is the momentum of what's going on right right now with, with Lamont, the positive momentum when you get a Cam Scott. And it just, it just, it's like anything. Once that momentum starts going positive when you have a good season like you did that no one saw coming, and you played the way you did, and you went to, uh, you know, Knoxville and won, and you beat Kentucky here, and, you know, you won a game in the SEC tournament, and, yeah, you were you were one and done in the NCAAs, but you were in the dance for the first time since 17. And it seems like what you watched last year, and I said this over and over again, there are times when a team has a season, and I'm not going to use the word fluky because that's not the right word, but it doesn't feel like it's got substance to sustain itself. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, there, there's one thing about getting hot at the right time and rolling that into a tournament appearance. There's one thing to be consistently good over the course of the entire season. And, and look, we don't know anything about anything until things happen, right? But it felt like what we watched last year wasn't that kind of a year where you just went on a heater and things happened that, oh, you can't sustain that way. 
it felt like Lamont Paris was laying a foundation with a certain culture and a certain system of playing basketball on both ends of the court. And he was, and it was the first time he really had that opportunity to lay that foundation going into year two. And it feels like it's something that's sustainable. Do I think they're going to win 25 to 30 games every year? No. But do I think they can be a solid to good SEC program that's going to get to the NCAA tournament their share of times and they're going to be competitive? Yeah. Yes. I think that is what was being built last year. I think that's a realistic expectation for what we saw last year. And I think competitiveness is the key word. Would you love to be one of the best one or two teams in the conference every single year? Absolutely. Is that going to happen? Probably not. But if you can always be in that conversation mm -hmm. of, hey, you're at least, you know, potentially around that double buy of the SEC tournament. You're always going to be in, you know, the field for the NCAA tournament and not having to be on bubble watch every March or just know that you're completely out of or anything like that. You make the tournament five times out of seven or eight years, you're doing pretty good at a place like South Carolina, and that's the kind of thing that you hope for from a consistency standpoint. Well, okay, so Lamont Paris learned to defeat a Bo Ryan at Wisconsin, right? Right. We always talk about that. And that team looked like a Wisconsin team the way they played last year. Very slow tempo, things of that nature. Wisconsin basketball under Bo Ryan, I'm not saying this is what Lamont Paris is going to do. But Bo Ryan at Wisconsin, matter of fact, he got at Wisconsin in 01 02. Uh, Bo Ryan made the NCAA tournament every season. Mm hmm. I'm not saying this is what Lamont Paris is going to do, but he learned from a guy who, again, did it in a certain way with a certain system and style and tempo and was very successful. So, like you said, if you can make the NCAA tournament, let's go three out of every five years. Let's just throw out that. If you can do that here in South Carolina, three out of every five years, you're always competitive. You know, you're never cratering at, you know, 9 and 29 or whatever. I think that's a, that, that's a nice way to go year to year for the basketball program here. And who knows, it could be even better. I don't know. But if you could set an expectation that's realistic from what has compared to what's going on historically here, I think Lamont Paris would be doing all right if he could pop the tournament three out of every five years. Yeah, absolutely. Again, for a program, as Ray mentioned, that went 50-some-odd years without winning a tournament game, and so you went back to the Final Four a couple of years ago. Again, mm -hmm. it's not like the, the standards and expectations are sky high to begin with. So if you can keep them consistently competitive on a year-in, year-out basis, that is what this program needs. All right, Shane Beamer, spring game uh, yesterday. I uh, was talking to the media. Game is, of course, this Saturday. You can hear it right here on the game, 107.5 The Game in Columbia. Let's uh, hit cut six real quick, Tyler. Shane talking about the atmosphere at the game. Yeah, one, we talk about just how grateful they should be that they play here at Carolina and they get to play in a spring game with that many people in the stands. And, and our guys know we're so appreciative of our, of our fan base and what makes this place special. And I was at a Gamecock Club event in uh, in Lancaster last night. Saw Hale up there. Thanks for being there, Hale, uh, as well. And But told that crowd that, that um, you know, I never take for granted that being able to have Gamecock walk a couple hours before the game or whatever time it is and being able to have that for a spring game, uh, a walk with fans that come out to see the team walk to the stadium. It's more than a lot of teams have for a regular season game. And then to be able to go into that stadium, I never take it for granted and uh, never will. And I don't want our players to, and I know they won't. So one, just how appreciative we are and how cool that is that you get to play at a place like South Carolina. But then two, like once the game starts, you got to be able to, you know, block all that out and you still got to go play football. And that we'll learn a lot about those guys as individuals and we'll learn a lot about our team on Saturday night. We want it to be fun. There's no doubt about it and, and enjoyable for everyone. But we, we're, we're competing too. And, um, and some guys, you know, it's an opportunity to really solidify yourself. You've had a good spring. Go finish it on Saturday night. You know, you haven't, maybe haven't had the week of practice you want this week, but you get an opportunity on Saturday night to, to go really show us what you're about. So there's a lot that can come out of it, and that's what we're telling those guys this week. And it is cool to embrace these things. Like, like the Gamecock walk is just, it is. It's, it's, yeah. it's pretty wild. And once I was told about it when I first got here and I saw it, I'm like, yeah, yeah. It, it's special. It is. And the idea to make your players understand how special that is and how invested, you know, a fan base is in what you're doing, I, I think that's something you always have to drive home because part of the culture and the tradition of your program and then go out there 
it's a game. Yeah. We're treating it. We're treating it as a game. Now, some people might be doing hot dog eating contests and and dunk contests. We're playing a game. We're having yeah. fun. We know it's not going to count. Yeah. But we're out yeah. there competing and playing a game. I think having a hot dog contest would still be fun while playing. I the game too. think so too. All right. Uh, Firehouse sub text the hour eight zero three four zero four sixty one hundred. Also, uh, what happened last night on the diamond uh, for Carolina baseball? That's next on the halftime show here on the game. Oh, time to hit the firehouse sub text of the hour here on the halftime show on the game. What do you got there, Tyler Head? Yeah, so Brad weighs in and says the GG, the one GG year uh, went great in retrospect. Paris forced him to mature as a person, as a player. He grew his game. I was more prepared for the NBA. GG acknowledges that, and everyone could see it. 
Cam sees it and sees he can win here as well as get ready for the NBA. Yeah, and I guess in retro, and Gigi Jackson talked about this uh, a little while ago, uh, that, you know, looking back, you know, there's things he could have, he would have done different and he should have done different and things he didn't know he was learning, he was picking up on. Again, he should have been a senior in high school, not playing college basketball. And, and we talked about that, so we got to keep that in mind. Now, again, does that excuse some of that stuff? No. It doesn't, but we but, think we were all 17, 18 yes. years old and the things that we thought and the things that we said and, you know, yeah, he went on Instagram Live in the locker room after game, which was not a good look, mm -mm. but he's not the only teenager that's done something no, like and that. He, and he, you know, his body language was awful at times on the bench, and he had some pouting going and things. And again, he's, he should have been in high school. And sometimes these kids reclassify, and it's a great idea, and sometimes they reclassify, and it's like, uh, looking back, probably not a good idea. Yeah. But, you know, Gigi Jackson got through it. Yes, he lost money being a second-round pick compared to a first-round pick. But it seems like his NBA career is heading in the right direction, and hopefully he's, it all works out for him. He's going to be around for a long time. And, But the flip side, when it was going on, it was not a good look for anybody. The no. team was struggling. It looked like, you know, Lamont, well, it looked like Lamont and the coaching staff was having a tough time controlling him because of the way he was. He it look, Remember, he got benched for a little bit, yep. and he was not starting anymore. But I will, say, I will give Lamont credit for something through that. The benching of Gigi Jackson was Lamont Paris saying this, I'll bench the five-star, so that means I'll bench anybody because we have some core values in this program that we're all going to follow. Sure. Whether you're a five-star or you're the guy wearing the gunner jersey. Right. You are going to adhere to certain basic tenets of what we're doing. And when Gigi didn't, for whatever, whatever was going on, Lamont stopped starting him. And brought him off the bench because he was having there was some issues, and Lamont said, "I got to do this because my program is bigger than one person." Right. And I think that showed the other players on the basketball team where this was going, and I think it helped set up year two if that makes any sense. Because if you would have caved in because you want to cater to the five star because you want to get more five stars because you know that five star is going to talk to other five stars, right? Of course, they have. They all have a, a group chat. They do. It's called chat. a five star group chat. That's right. And they do everything together as five stars. They have five star camping outings. They're just everywhere together as five stars. A lot of coaches would have catered to that five star because they wanted more five stars. Sure. Lamont said, "No, we got some rules around here. Everybody's going to follow them, even you, my man." And I think that started to set things up for year two. Because players, look, it's like anything. Bobby Knight would always go after his best player. Tear him up. Because you know why? Bobby Knight wanted the whole team to know he's not any more special than you guys. That's right. And I think what Lamont did last year, that was part of Lamont's mindset. Great. But if Lamont was just saying, well, no, I'm laying the foundation. Because guess what? I'm yeah. going to be here when Gigi's gone. Sure. I've got to lay the foundation of what I believe in and who I am and what I want this well, program to be. It's very much taking on that dad coaching role where, yeah, your star player, or your kid in this scenario is not going to like the punishment that you're giving to them. But when they get older, they're going to say, oh, that's why I did that. I learned my lesson. And I'm a better person because of it. And again, Gigi Jackson is doing a great job at the NBA level. Obviously just wrapped up his first season, um, but but had a great, you know, people did, people don't think he was going to even make it to the main roster this year. And he did. Yeah. Um, and, you know, can attribute a lot of that maturity and growing to his time here at South Carolina and a lot of the lessons that he probably learned from Lamont Paris. So good text. Appreciate that. That was excellent text. 803-404-6100, our firehouse subtext. The hour baseball last night. Hey, was it a win? It was. That's what matters. Exactly. Yeah, who cares if it's 4-3 to three or 400-3, to three, they all count as a win. That one got a little uh, that got a little tight last night. A little bit. I, I will say this, and look, I'm the president of the Garrett Ganey fan club. He needed last night. Yeah. He needed those solid two innings to close things. You saw him fired up doing his, you know, uh, Tony Montana machine <laughs> gun after the game. Like, he needed something to instill a little confidence because dude was lights out at the beginning of the season. That non-conference play, and yeah, mm -hmm. he gave up the one home run to Clemson. But other than that, like, dude, nobody could hit the guy. And then when conference play got started, these past couple weeks have just been really rough on him. He needed something. Yes, it's the Citadel. Yes, they had lost 10 out of their last 11 coming into last night. But from a confidence-boosting standpoint, I'm excited to see what Ganey's going to be able to do going forward now that he got a little bit of that swagger back last night. How about this guy? Cut 12 real quick, Tyler.
How about this guy the last few games? 3-2 to tip it. Swing and a deep drive in the air. Left field. Hello. Goodbye. Out of here. Baseball. Will Tippett with his third home run of the season. Well, in South Carolina, <laughs> a two-run lead in the top of the seventh inning. 4-2 game counts. Who would have figured that ended up being the winning run? He's uh, he's having a good run these past couple games. And, you know, it's stop switch hitting. You're much better as a right-handed hitter. Let's stop the experiment of switching. You can't, right? You struggle as a lefty. Yep. Not saying you can never do it again, but right now let's concentrate on what you do well, which is hitting in the right-handed batter's box. We'll get back in here. Football and more football in the halftime show.
Halftime show, 1 o'clock hour. Terry Ford Tyler Head, always the 1 o'clock hour. Football, 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 more football, and then we throw in some football to go with some football. Sponsored by our buds, Atlantic Windows and Doors. Shane Beamer obviously talking to the media yesterday, getting ready for the spring game. We're going to fire up some Shane here in just a minute. Um, you know, we, we talk about the spring game, and there's, there's, there's some people, look, everything's on the table now, right? In well, our world of college football. Totally. Everything. I would like to see, and I've said this, I'd love to see, like, South Carolina go play a spring football preseason game against, I don't know, Wake Forest, whoever. Just play a spring game against someone. Play against Wofford. Please play a spring game. Yeah. Every other sport collegiately has some kind of preseason games against other collegiate programs. Yeah. Baseball does it. Basketball has the super secret exhibition game you we gotta, all you heard about. The, you got to know the secret knock to get into those yeah, games. Yeah, exactly. And if not, you never heard from again. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, I, I would love to see football have that. Yeah. And the people say, yeah, somebody could get hurt. Somebody could get hurt in a spring game, too. Well, and here's the thing. You get hurt in a spring game, uh, assuming it's not a horrible injury, you have months to recover from it before the season rolls around. And, again, Jalen Nichols did get hurt in last year's spring game, so that possibility always exists. But, you know, tweaking an ankle in the spring game, is it going to keep you out from a August 31st kickoff? I just think when you line up against somebody wearing a different jersey with different helmets from a different place, <laughs> well, you get a little bit more uh, a little something-something in you. Well, and there's a lack of familiarity. Mm -hmm. You are scrimmaging against the guys that you've been practicing against for the past month. Yeah. You know what they're going to do. You know their mannerisms. You know what they're good at, what they're not good at. You go up against a Wake Forest or Wofford, you don't know as much about that guy. You're going to have to put your best foot forward to try and stop him, or he's going to have to do the same thing, try and stop you. Like mm -hmm. It just adds a different element to yes. it. Yes. There's a different level of intensity in that game. It just and, is. And I feel like we'd be able to pull a little bit more away from the performances in a spring game situation like that because it is more of a legitimate game. And, yes, this can be structured like a game. There's going to be officials. You know, the, the crowd's mm -hmm. going to be there. The clock's going to be running, all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, it's still an inter-squad scrimmage. Yeah. And, look, I like the spring game. There are people going, oh, you should get rid of it. And just, no, I like – here's why I like the spring game. Once again, there's one section of people in sports that have to make all the sacrifices in a lot of ways. Sure. And that's called the fans. The fans spend the money. The fans put their time into it. And very few fans generate revenue off of sports. Most fans are paying. Yes. Basically, it's a loss. You're paying for entertainment. Exactly. Throw them a bone, man. Have a spring game. Fans haven't seen a football game involving the South Carolina Gamecocks since the Clemson game in November, right? Yes. Right around Thanksgiving. Yes. Have not seen a game since. So four or five months, roughly. What's what's going to hurt to put together a game? It's not. I again, a perfect world would be a, a real game, a real preseason kind of game against another team, but at least a spring game where you have, you know, Garnet versus Black or whatever you're calling it, the fans can get together who want to scratch their football itch for a couple of hours in April. Well, and, What's that, the harm? and that's the thing is like they don't they don't have to open this up to the public. They've been doing scrimmages in the stadium for mm -hmm. the past couple of weeks. It is literally just an opportunity mm -hmm. to allow the fans to see the new teams, get used to who's wearing what number, mm -hmm. and you know gives the players a little bit more of an environment to play in front of, especially for true freshmen coming in that you know are used to playing in front of three thousand people in high school stadiums. All right, well here's. 20,000 people in williams Bryce Stadium. It's going to be a little bit different. You know, get used to it, obviously. And it's much, much different than what it's going to be in the fall when you're actually playing legitimate games. But for the most part, again, it's just a practice that people get to see at the end of the day. Yeah, and, and that's the fun part is people get to come out and watch football. And that's what they want right now. They want to come see their favorite team, get on the field, and run around in pads and play football. Right. So, look, everybody's got their own opinion, and that, that's fine. For me, taking away a spring game, you're not hurting the players. You're not hurting the coaches. You're hurting that 30, 20, 25, 30,000 who'd like to come and sit and just watch you do yeah. your thing. And, and I don't think anybody's advocating for spring games to go away completely. This isn't like the NFL Pro Bowl or something like no. that. 
Um, I just I do think there's different approaches you could take to it, and we've talked for a long time about the possibility of playing against like an FCS team or something like that to add the value of it actually being a legitimate game. Or you could go the other direction, like Ole Miss, yes. and say, hey. We're not going to treat this like a normal game. We're still going to get some reps in, but we're going to do seven on seven, make mm-hmm. sure these guys don't get hurt, and then we're just going to let these players have some fun and bring the entertainment value up a little bit more with you know these mini games and skills challenges and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, whichever direction you want to go, there should be, in my opinion, something in late mid to late April where you're getting the fans together in the stadium to just celebrate football's coming. Yes. Because really we have the spring game, we have SEC media days, and then it's go time finally in late August, early September. And from a fan base perspective, this is the least stressful time of the year. Yeah. But yes, you're still wanting answers like, hey, okay, who's our quarterback going to be? What's the wide receiver really going to look like? But it does not match the stress of camp leading up to the season. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. We haven't figured this out yet. Well, what's going on? We need we need to see who our quarterback's going to be, and I'm worried about this game and that game. And, of course, it doesn't match the, the stress of the season itself where a week-to-week basis you're living and dying on how good this team does. And that's the thing. Everybody still has those that hope. Yeah. Even Vanderbilt. Well, maybe not. Well, until but they everyone kick else, off. Right? Yeah, then they take the first snap. It's like, oh, there goes the hope. Yeah, hope's over. <laughs> so it's just the idea that – you have because everybody wants to have hope for their team. Of course, even at Arkansas right now, where Uncle Sam's had a rough go the last couple of years, they still believe that Pittman can recapture what he had three years ago. Right. Right. Everybody's got hope, and that's what's the cool thing about April and the spring game. You go out there and you're looking through this positive lens. Okay, I'm looking for stuff. I'm looking for stuff to give me hope. What's going to make me happy? That's what I'm looking for, and that's what's cool about the spring game. Or the spring hot dog eating contest or the spring slam dunk competition or whatever you're doing. Right. It's just you're you're right now you're in hope mode. And that's a good thing. All right, Shane talking to the uh media yesterday. You heard it here on the game in Columbia and in Myrtle Beach. I want to play a couple of things that go together here, Tyler. Um, first of all, let's let's go with cut eight, the exit interviews after the spring, because that leads into something else we want to talk about. Yeah, I'd say it's the same that it's it's always been. It's obviously a little bit different because you're having these meetings while the portal is open. There's no question about it. But uh, we've done it every year and, and have most places I've been. But spring game is on Saturday. And then Monday morning at 7 a.m., I'll start meeting with players. And I will i don't pick like a select few. I meet with every single player on the team. And it's basically 15-minute increments for three straight days from 7 a.m. until whatever time we finish each day. But in those – and they're doing the same with the assistant coaches with their players uh, at the position – or their position coach. But those meetings for me are how would you feel like the spring went. You know, we'll talk about academics and, and finishing up because exams are next week here at Carolina. We'll talk about kind of where they are, strengths, areas to improve – what they need to work on this summer. We'll talk about body weight because they're going to be able to go home a little bit for the month of May, and we don't need a guy that's 300 pounds coming back weighing 340, and we don't need a guy that's 195 coming back weighing 175. So we'll talk about body weight goals and what they're trying to get done this summer, and then we'll be honest with them and tell guys kind of where we see them right now and what their role is. And I don't want to ever – you know, trust is a core value of this program, and I don't ever want to lie to someone to keep them around here. I want to be honest and give guys opportunities to to go other places and play if they're not going to get the opportunity here to play um, because of where they are on the depth chart. So we're just we're honest with them, and if there's an issue, let's talk about it in those meetings as well. If there's something that they don't agree with or something they're unhappy with, I want them to tell me in that meeting and not a week later uh, when they've thought about stuff, you know, but I wouldn't say it's really changed, Mike. It's kind of been the same format we've always used, but it's certainly a different dynamic because of what's going on around you. There's no, no question about it. I mean, every time I look at my phone, there's a different, you know, news about someone at some other school and got guys that just transferred to schools in January that are back in the portal three months later as well. So it's just a, it's a different time. And um, but the meetings are still the same and how we coach these guys are still the same. So, all right. So the interview and I love the way Shane talks about, look, I'm being honest with these dudes. Trust is one of the core values of the program. I'm not going to sit and BS you to keep you around. If I think right now you're sitting fourth on the depth chart of your position. We love your potential. We love your ability and your ceiling. But right now, here's where you're at. 
Two, here are the things we think you can do to get better, to get where you want to be and we want you to be, which is a starter. Here are the things we love. Da -da 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 -da. Now, if you're honest, they walk out the door, they can walk out of your door right into the transfer portal. Yeah. Which we've seen the Dr. Pepper commercial. It's a real thing. It is. It's a black hole that sucks your team in, and if you don't, uh, you know, let go of your Dr. Pepper, you're going to lose your entire team. But then again, lesson learned from that. You can't let go of your Dr. Pepper hand. No, you can't. There's there's plenty of quarterbacks out there. Quarterbacks come and go. Trees. Uh, that's right. So yeah. that is the the area that's been added to this, right? Yeah. Sure. So now let's get to cut one. And this is Shane Beamer talking about the portal and possible transfer portal targets for South Carolina. Yeah, um, I think in a, always with the portal being open, you have to look at how you can make your team better. And that's my job as the head coach. If there's someone that fits what we're about on the field and off the field, it's my job as the head coach to try and get them in here into our program. We're like <clears throat> every program and every coach, David, and that every position we have a target number of guys that we want to have on scholarship and some of those positions some positions were at that position we're at that number other positions were not offensive line right now based on the target number of guys that we would like to have on scholarship we're a couple under um wide receiver right now we're a couple under there's some positions that we might be over but certainly from a depth standpoint being able to practice have a, have your full arsenal receiver and offensive line are two positions not that i'm saying we need to get better but just from a depth standpoint being able to practice have a two deep guys on scholarship those are positions that just uh uh we're not where we want to be as far as the minimum number of guys that we have on scholarship does it mean that it's we're you know in trouble if we don't add people there no but those would be a couple spots that we're looking at just from a depth standpoint for sure i mean you know would we like to see them get a wide receiver who's like 6'3 and can go play out wide and big catch radius, win jump balls, be that guy down the field that forces you to roll coverage and pull the safety out of the middle of the field and all that? Yes, we would love to see that. Would you love to add another offensive lineman to a room that you do have a ton of dudes, but you're never going to have too many? And we saw what happened last year. Personally, I would also love to see them go get a corner. Yeah. I know. Well, I feel like they like what they have, right? Because it, they haven't really been chasing corners. Sure. It, if the option's out there to get a guy that you know is a bona fide cover corner, they can come in and slide in that other spot opposite uh, of uh, O'Donnell Fortune. Then yes, absolutely go out there and get him. But going back to his main point there, if they got nobody from the portal, assuming they don't lose any high production guys mm -hmm. in the portal, they're still going to be fine. Like yeah. it's not make or break. Like oh my god, I brought this point up earlier. Last year they needed a running back in the portal. That was objective yeah. number one coming out of the spring. We need to find a running back. They didn't find one, and DeCarrie on Joyner had to play running back last year, and we all know how that went. So even if you don't get anyone, you're still in good shape across the board. Yeah, that was an issue before spring, and yeah. <laughs> then it became an issue after spring. It just, it was an issue. And they've done a really nice job bringing in pieces. And for some reason, and they know better than we, because they watch the practices, they like their young corners. Yeah. They they like whether it's Collier, Floyd, Swain. You know, they're hoping maybe David Spaulding can stay healthy because he can play all defensive backfield positions. They like where they're at because they – look, you can see – look, it doesn't take, a, you know, some football genius to know – you can see what they were doing. we got to get running backs. we got to get wide receivers. We want to get better on the line of scrimmage on both sides of the ball. we got to add linebackers. You didn't hear a lot of sniff – I mean, I know, I know Kilgore's brother came in, but yeah. – you didn't hear a lot of sniffing around the around corners. So maybe they saw all those other areas of need were more important. And also maybe they said, you know what? We really like the young defensive backs we have. And Coach Gray does a nice job coaching and developing. So, all right, we'll get back in here. Football, football, football. There is a talking head and a talking face that thinks very highly of Spencer Rattler. We're going to get to that next halftime show. Terry Ford, Tyler Head, rolling till three on the game.
football, 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 one o'clock hour here on the Halftime Show, sponsored by Atlantic Windows and Doors. Terry Ford, Tyler Head. All right, uh, obviously NFL Draft coming up. Uh, we're under two weeks now before the NFL Draft will kick in Detroit. Well, really, it's uh, oh, eight days. It's, it's eight days. It's next Thursday. Jeez, we are almost one. a week. Ah, well, so it, it flips. Some years it's in, like, the first weekend in May. Some yeah. years it's the last weekend in April. But, yeah, it's yeah, so a week from tomorrow. Almost a week out from so, the NFL draft in uh, Detroit. If you're a betting person, Caleb Williams is the number one pick. I'd go ahead and lock that in. You sure about that? I'm 99.9% <laughs> sure. All right, so a lot of talk here has been about Xavier Leggett and Spencer Rattler. Leggett, we've seen some mocks here lately. The last pick of the first round going to the Kansas City Chiefs, which would make Xavier Leggett probably cry with happiness to go play with Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid. Um, we'll get to where we'll get here. Uh, Dane uh, Brugler has his mock draft, and I'm going to tell you where Rattler and Leggett are. It's a seven-round mock. Love Brugler. He does this thing called The Beast mm. in The Athletic. It's like it, it is breakdowns of just about every player eligible for the draft. A draft dork like me loves this thing. But Brugler did a seven-round mock. And we'll get to it in a minute. But I want to swing first over. Robert Griffin III uh, was on ESPN. Uh, I guess it was on Get Up. With, uh, this was actually on his podcast On the yesterday. podcast. It wasn't so on Get Up. Okay, he, it's on. He, he takes questions from fans, and he was posed the question of who he thought the steal of the draft was going So to. here's Robert Griffin III on his podcast giving his thoughts on who he thinks the steal of this year's NFL draft is. The quarterback position, I think the steal of the draft – is going to be Spencer Rattler. When you turn on this man's tape, he has arm talent out the wazoo. I mean, go watch any of his games, but specifically go watch the Florida game and watch him make big throw after big throw, big throws with people in his face. He was unfazed all season despite having to play in a leaky pocket. And when you actually go back and break down all of his games, you see how mobile he is. You see how willing and able he is to not just scramble but make throws on the run. Like he never complained about the offensive line being leaky. He just found ways to make plays and get the ball to Xavier Leggett. So I think Spencer Rattler – a guy that was at Oklahoma, was there because he was a big-time recruit as a five-star five player who has the arm talent, who has the accuracy, who has the pre-snap and post-snap ability, and played in a system at South Carolina that forced him to make those, you know, craved and wanted for three-level throws that they use in the NFL off of play action. He had a great senior bowl. I think he is showing teams that the player that he was coming out of high school is actually going to translate better to him being a better pro quarterback than he ever was a college quarterback. But I think he's going to be the still of the draft. If someone can scoop him up in the second round and or the third round, uh, they're going to be very happy with the product that they get. Look, I, I don't disagree with Robert Griffin III about Spencer Rattler. Now, steal of the draft means the whole draft, right? The quarterback position, when he's when he pushed it down into the quarterbacks, I can see where he's going with Rattler sure. because, and maybe because we've watched him closer than most, yeah, for the last two years, and what he did his first year at South Carolina compared to what he did his second year. Look at the end of the year, when again Shane had to have the talk with Marcus Satterfield about the offense. And then it got rolling against Tennessee and Clemson. And then watching what Dow Loggins and Spencer Rattler together got to achieve last year with all the injuries everywhere around them. Mm -hmm. I would just, the improvement in Rattler, I think, just like the gunslinger throws, just they dropped like. Yeah. Unbelievably. Well, so we, we brought up the stat plenty of times before those turnover worthy plays that he was certainly guilty of making quite a few of those in his early career in college. He cut those in half between year one and year two at South Carolina. He was making better decisions. He was reading the field a whole lot better, not putting the ball in harm's way, which, again, that's that's the kind of things that really stand out to these you know NFL scouts and executives. They want a quarterback that's going to be able to take care of the ball. I, I also think it's interesting that RG3 pointed out the Florida game last year, which, again, is a game that Carolina lost, so we don't harp on it as much. But in terms of performances, legitimately one of his best performances as a quarterback at South Carolina. Went 23 of 30, 313 yards, four touchdowns, one interception. Seven of 10 on throws down the field, 10 yards or more. Was 11 of 14 when facing the blitz. Yeah. 
against the Blitz, and we talk about the PFF grades all the time. We all know that anything 70 or above is great. 91.2 PFF grade that day against the Blitz and a, a, a Florida defensive front led by Prince Liu that was playing pretty well at that point in time. And obviously we know about the leaky pocket, as RG3 put it, like masterful performance by Spencer Rattler. Unfortunately, the game was not won, so we don't talk about it as much. But, I mean, that probably popped a lot of scouts' eyes saying, man, this kid's special. You know, the, the, flip, the people that bring up some stuff, and I, you know, I've read it, I think the Netflix thing, If I, once somebody starts talking about that, I, I tune them out. That was a teenager. I didn't want to hear about that anymore. This is a grown man now at, what, right. 22, 23 years old. I don't care about Netflix series. I don't care. The legit stuff, I get it. You know, when you see some of the scouts and some of the other things that are talking about his strengths and weaknesses, like that A&M game where he had the three intentional groundings, I get yep. it. Yep. You can't do that. And even Shane said, you know, we, we can't do that. Now, again, was there a lot of heat and pressure on him from a bad off, a bad beat-up offensive line? Sure. But you can't have those plays. I know that, again, sometimes did he bail out of the pocket quick? Yes. But my thought is this, Tyler. When you're running for your life on every snap almost, isn't it going to be like your, like your go-to movement to be, I got to get the hell out of here? Yeah. And, and that's, I'm not trying to make an excuse for it. Yes, Spencer has to get better staying in the pocket and going through all of his progressions. He can't bail early out of the pocket. He can't have three intentional grounding calls in a game. Heck, in a season. I get some of the things I see when I read the scout strength and weaknesses on Rattler, but I guess I just watch. He got so much better from year one at South Carolina to year two. And I think if you put him in the right position with the right coaching staff and he doesn't have to be rushed onto the field, I think you have a shot to groom him. Yeah. Look, nothing's a guarantee. And I just saw, and Brugler's, um, Dane Brugler in the athletic, in his seven round mock, guess where he put him? Uh, probably third round. Round 376, pick to Denver. <laughs> That's exactly where uh, um, Field Yates and um, Kuiper and Mel Kuiper put him. him. And they, they did put in there that he has the ability to compete with Jared Stidham for that starting now, job. How about not yet? Yeah, Let's I, not I, have that. I'd say probably not. Um, I, I would much rather want to see him sit, develop a little bit more and, and you know, maybe get the keys turned over to him a couple years down the yes. line. Um, yes. And this I, is not because we think Jared Stidham's so great. He's not. No. But I don't want to see Spencer Rattler rushed on the field because I think he's a guy that needs that time. Sure. And Sean Payton, last time I checked, knows what's up with quarterbacks. Yeah, like he'd he be in good hands there. And I think developing and getting ingrained in that system before getting things turned over to him would, would probably benefit him, um, you know, benefit him the best. Yeah, I just, I just think – that I mean, and he works. All we heard about is him being a worker, first guy, last guy. You know, would he, and and the one thing I did read that I don't agree with, and one of the uh, negatives against him was he's a guy that's looking for the limelight all the time. No, I didn't see that here. He no. came, he well, came here, and he went straight to work. He wasn't a limelight guy. He was a worker. That's all we heard. And his two years here. I didn't see a guy that was looking to be me, me, me. I just didn't so, see it. So Charles Davis, uh, NFL analyst, has his list of what he calls prospects he'd pound the table for. Spencer Rattler's at the top of that list. And he put in there, talking about his maturity, remember, this was a five-star recruit, widely considered the best quarterback in his class, eventually lost his job to Caleb Williams in 2021, transferred to South Carolina. His setback has become a comeback, though. He faced that adversity had to reassess himself, come to a place, and basically reemerge in people's eyes because people have written him off. Mm -hmm. His first year at Carolina through those first 10 games, like, uh, you know what? Yep. He's a bust. He's over the hill. You know, he's not going to amount to anything. People weren't talking about him coming away from that season outside of, you know, the game that he had against Tennessee. But a lot of people are like, oh, it's flash in the pan, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then he translates that into the success that he had the past year again. It's not great the team went 5-7, and seven, but that's not his fault. He went out there and played great. And, the other, and I think Charles Davis makes a great – and now a great point that, you know, he was pushed onto the quarterback trash heap. Oh, yeah. We, we do that so quickly with five stars. Yeah. And, 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 you know, oh, Caleb Williams beat him out. He got benched. And then the world, bad attitude. Oh, blah, 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 blah. All right. Now, as we come to South Carolina, the plan is one year at South Carolina, rebuilt my tape myself and go to the NFL. Well, guess what? That didn't work out either. Right. Had to stay a second year. What do you do? Kept grinding, kept working, got with the right guy in Dow Loggins. A lot of things got better. Does he have to, is there some things he has to work on? Absolutely. Is a third round pick fair? Yes. But at the end of the day, I do think 
that he trends in the right direction more than some people want to give him credit. I just do. I think it's going to be very interesting watching his NFL career. All right, football, football, football in the 1 o'clock hour. We'll get back to some more Shane comments. We'll tell you where Xavier Leggett goes in old Dane's mock, too. That's coming up on the halftime show. Terry Ford, Tyler Head. More Shane on the spring game coming up on the game.
We're doing football, 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 sponsored by Atlantic Windows and Doors here on the game, like we do every day in the 1 o'clock hour. In case you missed any of the Cam Scott from this morning uh, with uh, – with Bill and the early game, we're going to re-rack you some of that for what's trending at two because on our little radio station, that's what was trending. It what is trending today was Cam Scott popping on at 8 a.m. to make his announcement. He's going to play his college basketball for Lamont Paris here at South Carolina. I tried to edit out all as much as I could as Bill talking about himself because <laughs> there was quite a bit of that. What does that, what does that leave the rest of the interview though? Why would anyone want to listen if that wasn't included, right? <laughs> All right, so we'll be, like I said, we'll be doing that between 2 and 2.30 for you today for What's Trending at 2, sponsored by uh, Traditions Fine Jewelry and Gamecock Traditions. All right, real quick, to, to finish up the piece about the mock drafts, we talked about Spencer Rattler a lot in the last uh, segment. Robert Griffin III loves him. Her at Charles Davis, a big fan of Rattler in this draft. Uh, Dane Brugler for The Athletic, who does phenomenal draft coverage. Again, the beast is, it is... If you got it, it would look like a phone book. Yeah. Of, well, I can't imagine the time he has to put into it. it it's ridiculous. And Brugler, um, he has Spencer Rattler, just like Mel Kuyper and Field Yates doing their mock, going to the Denver Broncos at 76. Interesting about Xavier Leggett with um, this mock, that Brugler doesn't have Leggett going to Kansas City at 32. Matter of fact, doesn't have Leggett going in the first round. He has Xavier Leggett falling to the bottom of the second round, going to my Baltimore Ravens at 62. Yes, I'm a part owner. Um, to my Raven. Look, I would love to see Xavier Leggett running around in a Ravens jersey myself. I, can't see I don't think he goes that, that far. far. Now, I don't. I, to, to my knowledge, we haven't had one of those traditional, ooh, this guy's got character issues, things that usually no. tumble guys 10 or 12 Or picks. some phantom injury concern yeah, or something. Again, that's gamesmanship. That That's teams playing chess yeah. with each other. They, mm -hmm. All right, we're going to make sure these going to fall to us so these guys don't grab them at the 33rd pick or whatever. Like, I'm looking here in the – well, first of all, in the first round, instead of taking Leggett, um, Brugler has Kansas City taken your boy uh, Mitchell, A.D. Mitchell from okay. Texas. Now, again – all these guys are on that level. The pass catching room for the draft is very deep. Yeah, absolutely. And then Lad McConkey, uh, McConkey is going to the Panthers at 33. We see Leggett maybe go there. Uh, the Chargers would take Keon Coleman from Florida. I take Leggett over Coleman. I think Coleman's a one trick pony. Okay. Um, he's a big guy, jump ball guy. I don't know how he's going to be able to. Uh, there's concern about getting separation in the NFL for Coleman. So, but again, Brugler has Coleman going to the Chargers, basically replacing Mike Williams, mm -hmm. who uh, moved on. Um, let's see, other wide receivers in that second round. Like, the Colts taking Ricky Pearsall. Now, again, if you're looking for somebody that you look for really as a slot-type guy and you want to take Ricky Pearsall at 46, I get that one. Roman Wilson to the Steelers at 51. There's no way I'm taking Roman Wilson over Xavier Leggett. That's just me. Nah. And then you get to Leggett at the bottom of the first round of the Ravens. I don't think Leggett falls that far. I don't think, honestly, he would fall past the middle of the second round. I just don't. But that's just me. So, again, a lot of those guys are on a certain level together. But a lot of those wide receivers that Brugler put ahead in his mock to those teams, I think Leggett will go to one of those before he falls to my Ravens at 62. Yeah, That's just me. Probably. I mean, at, at, at worst, I don't think he's getting past, like, the 40th pick. No, no I don't either. I don't either. Um, I think, look, I go back to the Chargers really quick. Look, no offense to Keon Coleman. I get the second-round grade on Coleman. A lot of people have second-round grade on Keon Coleman. Just Keon Coleman's a very big guy. Leggett is – Leggett reminds a lot of people – of A.J. Brown or D.K. Metcalf. He, he is a physical specimen. Right. and But but he's also got speed, and he's and he's got good, good solid hands. He can get those contested catches. And, and I just think that Leggett is much more, right now, coming out of college, a more rounded receiver than Coleman. That's just I, me. I, I do wonder, and Jay and Elijah talked about this a lot yesterday, um, that, you know, Leggett was listed at 6'3 here at South Carolina. As it turns out, apparently that's actually – six foot one mm -hmm. you know per the combine and stuff right. like that is that dinging him in people's eyes or maybe they don't think he's that true okay. one because he's a little bit shorter now suddenly you know what some people have prototypes i don't agree with the prototypes sure again look bill polian built 
three teams that went to Super Bowls. Bill Polian was a maniac on prototypes. I just think you let guys slip by you when you are so rigid on prototypes. And if somebody's going to ding Legat because all of a sudden he's 6'1 instead of 6'3, okay. Well, he plays bigger than himself, then, yeah. if, if that's the case. Yeah, so I think Legat doesn't last longer than mid-second round, but I think Legat would go f a lot quicker than 62. So, all right. So, and again, we'll pick more at mock drafts, obviously, between now and uh, and the actual draft itself. But yeah, Dane Brugler with his seven-round mock. Um, and we were just kind of picking through that. All right, Shane Beamer, spring game. Talked about a lot yesterday, and Shane will be on Carolina Calls tomorrow night. Mark Kingston tonight on Carolina Calls at 6 to talk Carolina baseball. Tomorrow, Shane Beamer, Carolina Calls, 6 p.m. to talk spring game and Gamecock football. All right, let's uh, spin off to this one real quick. Um, let's go to number two, uh, Tyler. How much stock Shane uh, puts in the spring game itself? Yeah, I'd say it's a combination of both. I'm not one of those guys, Mike, that looks at the spring game and say it doesn't matter because it does. It's another opportunity to go on the field and compete. It's an opportunity to get better. And some guys, frankly, they step up when the lights come on, if you will, and they're gamers. So there's a 14 practice body of work that obviously we put a whole lot of weight on. But we're not one of those people that just say, hey, let's just throw something out there entertaining and 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 go home. I mean, we're we're competing and <clears throat> they, we want to win those each particular team does. And I like I think there's something to the fact that when there's people in the crowd, the lights are on, it's on television that some guys step up and elevate their games and really you notice them and some guys you hopefully don't but some guys maybe go the other direction so I think it's a great indicator and it's so important because as you guys have heard me say before we don't get a preseason game in college football and we don't get a scrimmage against another team so for a lot of these guys it'll be the biggest crowd they've ever played in maybe and for a lot for all of them it'll be the biggest crowd we play in front of until we do it for real against Old Dominion in August so it's a great barometer for individuals and how they perform in those situations without a doubt I like the idea it's a mix. I mean, you're not going to take the spring game and make it more important than the other practices. Just like you're probably not going to hold a bad spring game against a guy who played really well through all the practices. But, you know, you are competing. And I, I'm with you. <laughs> you know, I don't mind a little hot dog eating contest. Yeah, I, I think kind you of could, fun. I think you could balance it a little bit. And mm -hmm. I, I understand from the standpoint of wanting to make it look like as close to a game as sure. possible as opposed to what Ole Miss did with making it a seven on seven where you really can't derive a whole lot from that. So yeah. I get it. Um, I do think, and I, I'm going to be interested to see how programs on the country kind of look at what a team like Ole Miss did and say, hey, maybe we could add some of those elements to it to make it more of that. And Dimitri brought up a really good idea this morning, a fan fest type of thing in sure. addition to having a game that is going to be beneficial for the development of your team. Um, so maybe kind of a hybrid of the two. Yeah, again, this should be an event and a celebration of football this part of the season. The fans get to get, you know, and get the Jones in of being able to watch some football in some way, shape, or form. It's kind of everybody's getting together, right, to check the temperature in the spring before you move on to talking season. Right. All right, uh, we'll get back in here. Our firehouse sub text the hour at our text line, 803-404-6100, as we talk football, football, and more football on the halftime show on the game.
time to check our firehouse sub text of the hour on the halftime show. Uh, 803-4460-100. What do you got there, Tyler Head? So, um, you know, we're talking about our ideas for spring games. And, of course, we, we discussed our longstanding idea of potentially playing an FCS team. And mm-hmm. uh, you brought up the point that spring is about time for hope and, and optimism going into the season. Nameless Texter weighs in with a good point. Unless Carolina loses, then you'd never hear the end of it. Because <laughs> uh, if you lose to Furman in April, yeah, I know you're setting up for a rough summer. That is a good point. It is. Now, the idea is you wouldn't lose that game. Right. I mean, that's your thought, right? That right. you wouldn't. You would. And that's the thing, right? Okay, so which direction do you want to go? Do you want to play like a Furman or a Wofford or whoever with the idea that you're going to bring them in, you should beat them up or at least win, and then you write them a check and they go home and everybody's happy. But what if you do lose? Or do you go play like another power conference team? That way if you lose, okay, lost, but at least it was a power conference squad and it wasn't an FCS team. I think you can maybe even do something similar to what NFL teams do in the preseason where you practice with the team for a couple of days and then play them mm-hmm. on Friday in your preseason or just scrimmage against them, whatever it may be. So that way you're also getting different looks in practice against guys that you're not familiar with and then playing a game against a viable opponent that, yeah, if you lost to Wake Forest in April, eh, who cares? You know what I mean? It's, again, more about the development more than anything well, else. the interesting part about the NFL, if you talk to coaches, they'd much rather have the controlled scrimmages with other teams and play preseason games. Right. Because, again, the word controlled is in the sentence for a reason. You're working on things you want to work on. You're putting together things you want to see. And typically you have an agreement with the other team about what you're trying to accomplish. Every now and then everybody gets into a fight. Happens in all these. Sure. But the control practices are much more beneficial to coaches than the actual preseason type games. Right. So I like where you're going with that of... You bring in, and we'll use Wake Forest. You bring in, you have a couple days of practice with Wake Forest. Then you're going to play your quote unquote spring game with them, and you get a lot. You get a lot out of it because you get to play against somebody that's not you. But the more value is to like the two days of practice against that team, where you can put your team in situations and look at combinations that matter to you. Where you can stop and go, okay, hey, here's what I want to do here. Let's do this. So I like that idea. I yeah. really do. But and the texture does have a good point. That's so, so good. Lose. What if you like, lose that game? Then what? You got to spend the next God knows I, how many months. I, I was, I was going to say, you think people like to dog each other for attendance at spring games? You lose to an FCS team. I oh. heard you guys couldn't even beat Furman in your spring game. What's going on with that? But it's funny because, like, basketball, you know, you play these exhibition games. And, like, you know, top 25 teams at times will lose to athletes in action or lose to some team they should have no business losing to. People really don't go nuts because there's more than one exhibition game, right? There and is. Yeah. So, well, football, though, if you got one and you would lose to that FCS team, yeah. Well, that and, taste is and, not going to be good for a while. And, I get it. And, and football in general, just having so few games over the course of the season because over the course of a of an entire baseball season or basketball season good teams lose to bad teams all the time like that's not an abnormal thing i mean we talk about the carolina teams that what lost to citadel in the midweek and national championship years in baseball and who really cares at the end of the day but football because you only have so few games to pick from that's why people can hyper focus on you guys couldn't even beat that team that went five and seven last year you know what i mean um so i feel like it'd be a little bit of that just because there's so few samples to pull from when you're talking about a football season yes and that and to the texture's point that sucker would linger yeah and linger that that, that, that would sting a little bit going through that's, the summer that's a great text yeah what are you thinking about that i was yeah. like yeah, who cares it's a, it's a game that doesn't count we, we, but we we are assuming they're going to win these games i guess is the best way to put it but yeah if, if you if you lose then yeah which you want to talk about a confidence oh. booster for Furman or wofford or whoever mm-hmm. that team is that you're playing like we just beat an sec team in their spring game yeah we're going all us. the way this year but book your tickets to Frisco right now. Right. And the flip side is, though, you have your fan base of the power school going, oh, my God, but, lost to them. But I will famously Ugh. say, 2008, the Detroit Lions were 4-0 in the preseason. And what happened? Uh, the 0-16. I always use that, too, as an example. When people, like, get crazy over preseason games, I'm like, first of all, I'll go like this. Okay, who had the best record in the preseason last year? I don't know. 
who are the worst? Oh, no. What was your record in the preseason? I don't know. Don't care. And then you go back to, hey, the Lions, when they were 0-16, you know what the record in the preseason was? What? A 4 no. They were the uh, they were the NFL champions of August, which yes. accounts for nothing. It ca- you don't get a trophy. There's no parade. Well, we, we can ask Langston Moore. He yeah. did not get anything for winning all four of those preseason <laughs> games. So, yeah, it's losing in, in the preseason in any sport is whatever. But to fans, there's a certain section of fans who even live and die on that. And to, and to your, what, your point, football has so few games compared oh, yeah. to basketball or baseball or hockey or whatever. That yeah, you lose that one, especially yep. with a fan base that has some has some losses in their past that torture them. Sure, doesn't help you. I'd recommend not getting on Twitter for a while after that one. <laughs> that would not be good. All right, coming up on what's trending at two here on the game. Uh, if you missed the, and by the way, we thank you for the text like always on uh, Firehouse Subtext, the hour on our text line at 803 404 6100. Coming up, what's trending at two from Traditions Fine Jewelry and Gamecock Traditions. In case you missed Cam Scott's announcement and conversation with Bill Gunner on the early game at around 8 a.m. this morning, we're going to re rack that for you so you can hear the thoughts of the new South Carolina Gamecock uh, basketball players. So that's coming up next on what's trending at two on the halftime show. Terry Ford, Tyler Head here on the game.
Welcome back into the halftime show. Tyler Head, Terry Ford, along with you here on your Wednesday on the game. It is 2 o'clock and time to hit what is trending at 2. And not only what's been trending at 2, what's been trending all day long is the big announcement from earlier on this morning. Cam Scott of Lexington High School committing to the University of South Carolina after uh, decommitting from the University of Texas last week. And this was on the early game with Bill Gunter uh, this morning. And uh, Cam Scott was gracious enough to hang around for the remainder of the 8 o'clock hour. And and Bill asked him a litany of questions about all kinds of things about his basketball career and what he's looking forward to here at South Carolina. We'll replay some of that conversation for you right now. We'll start off with uh, Cam Scott talking about playing closer to home. For sure. I mean, I was just a a really big contributing factor, you know. I grew up pretty much a lot of my teenage years here and my early adulthood, soon to be. So, you know, just staying home, staying around where I'm from, my family, my friends, uh, people who grew up watching me play basketball pretty much for most of this. uh, It's just really been an honor. Uh, But being able to be 20 minutes down the road, I mean, it's kind of exciting, you know. Big things going to happen. Mom's cooking, big part of that. Oh, yeah, you know that. What's the best thing she cooks? What will you be going home for? Because I remember I, I came to Carolina. I was 20 minutes down there. I wasn't an athlete, but I remember going home for cooking. What's the thing that, that you'll be popping in on mom and dad for? Um, I definitely got to go with the mac and cheese. Okay. Uh, specifically the baked mac and cheese. All the other mac and cheeses aren't that good, but the baked ones where it's at. You now, know, have you talked? Chicken too. Have you hold on, real on the on the on the mac and cheese? Have you talked to Coach Paris about this? No, not yet. You know, he has a he. We had him in studio. One of the things we talked about was indeed his mac and cheese. He says that's his specialty. Oh, I have to try. He's got it. a specialty mac and cheese. I'll be the judge of that one. That's, that's my <laughs> cup of tea right there. <laughs> Got to see what that's looking like. And then you said the baked chicken. Yeah, that's preferably baked chicken. You know, that's, that's my go-to, honestly. And what the big announcement was? The name is Cam Scott, and I am now a South Carolina Gamecock. There you go. So it's official now. Cam Scott joining Lamont Paris and his staff. He will be enrolling. When when do you enroll? June? July? Have you decided? I believe it's June. Oh, you're going to love it. If I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah. Good times. Good times. Well, let's got to tell you what. We got a special guest for you. Got a, got a special guest for you. Let's get out to the Love Chevy phone line. Somebody who wants to congratulate you. Let's go out to the Love Chevy phone lines. You try my job. Say, welcome in. Welcome in. <laughs> yo! <laughs> yo! Yo, 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 yo. Big energy Yay! guy. What's up? Rock! What's up, my brother? How you doing, man? Congratulations, my guy. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Oh, hold on. You got you to gotta tell everybody who you are. It's yeah. radio. I, I'll let you introduce uh, yourself also. What's up, radio? I'm one of the assistant coaches for the women's side, Khadija Sessions. Um, long-time trainer um, in the city uh, before I got this job this past year. Um, and was grateful to be one of Cam's first trainers, mentors. That's my that's my guy. So um, I want everybody in Gamecock country to welcome him in and show him the type of love you guys give to uh, Gamecock uh, players and everybody that wants to come be a Gamecock. I'm just so proud of him. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Now, what is she? I've heard about Khadija as a trainer. I've, I've, I've heard. What was she like as a trainer? If you're not mentally tough enough, you're not gonna make it through. <laughs> How much do you think she helped you early? Your early development, your early stages, getting to where you were. Uh, I feel like it. It more so helped me later on. Um, you know, because at a younger age, you kind of just hear the trainer talking. You're not really picking up what they putting down. So it's kind of like. I wouldn't say it's necessarily in through one ear, out through the other, but it doesn't really settle in until you fully experience it. But, you know, being able to actually go out and experience some of the things that she was talking about, it made a whole lot of sense later on. Was there a day or how many days were there that you left training with Khadijah? Because I've heard again a lot about, and you were were like, Mom, Dad, man, she's crazy. Like, I don't 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 know if we're going back to that. I don't think I ever, like, told them, honestly, but... I've definitely thought it multiple times, especially mid-workouts. When she'd do some of the things she'd do, I'd just be like, all right, you're doing too much now. <laughs> but all in all, it was definitely worth it. Uh, just going to keep her in touch, keep her intact, you know. She's been a great support uh, person for me. So just keeping her around, it's been great. 
Uh, Khadija, uh, knowing, hearing about you, unfortunately, the Midlands lost one of the best trainers they had, but Dawn Gray, uh, snagged one of the best uh, individual workouts, best coaches she could have grabbed. So congratulations to you. And, man, we appreciate you calling in this morning to congratulate this this guy on a, a phenomenal accomplishment. Uh, no problem, man. I appreciate you guys for having me. Take care. Khadija Sessions, yeah, you, right. you, uh, you, you put yourself through a lot of work. Was there a game younger? somewhere along the line where you went, man, I can, I can be pretty good at this sport. I might, I might, uh, you personally, was there a game that you realized, man, I, I've got some talent here. Uh, I'll say my first game. You know, when? I, uh, first game of high school uh, in eighth grade. It's like 2019, right? Yeah, no. Turn, turn, hit coach's mic on there. Coach Pope, Coach Elliot Pope in with us this morning. We actually got a full crowd in here uh, as well. So, yeah, I think it was his uh, game, his eighth grade year, um, technically one of two games in his entire high school career. He didn't start at Lexington, but had to let some of the older guys kind of show that they could do it or not do it. And, you know, I think he went in and about 20 seconds into that ball game versus yeah, Lugolf Elgin. Some real quick. So it was, uh, I think, his first game in high school. He was uh, close to 20 and 10, 20 yeah, and 12, something like that. Had so 30. <laughs> We knew pretty early on. We knew pretty early on it was going to be it was going to be a fun ride with this one. Your mom and I, well, we were talking off air, and there was the really neat tweet that uh, Christy Morlando, the the mother of PJ Morlando, put up the other day. Um, for people that don't know, I mean, you were you were a three sports star. I've mm -hmm. talked with Coach Bailey here, so I was telling you off air uh, about there was a slight battle that had to be had for your services, whether it was on the football field as a wide receiver or, or a basketball star. And your, as your mother was telling me, uh, your last baseball game was in the Dixie Youth World Series where you played with PG, PJ Morlando. How did you end up deciding on basketball? What was that thing that you said, man, I, I love that sport more than the other ones? I uh, definitely just felt like basketball. I just felt like I had a different connection with it, you know. So, you know, just being able to play around, play throughout the whole summer, uh, pretty much my whole life, just I felt like when it really came down to the decision-making, it was a no-brainer at that point. And I was like, I got to stick with it. When was that? When do you think that was in life? Mm, I'll say around seventh grade, okay. sixth grade. It was when I really decided that basketball was going to be my number one. Again, for those just tuning in that's been wondering, Cam Scott, Lexington High School uh, state champion. Nobody can ever take that away from you. You'll get a ring. I meant to bring mine in here. It doesn't fit anymore. <laughs> uh, but uh, you, nobody can ever take that away from you. And I, and I want to go back to this because it's a, it's something that does bother me in high school these days. You stuck with your local program. You didn't – I don't know whether it was you didn't need to feel you proved yourself or whatever. You stayed at Lexington. You stayed with mom and dad. You stayed in your community, and you represented your community. Do you understand how special that is that – you can always go back to that high school and say, I did this. I brought home another state champion. Uh, honestly, I kind of feel it, but I feel like it was more so hearing it from other people that it really settled in and they really respected my decision on staying, especially with winning a state championship. So, uh, you know, just hearing it from other people, I feel like it meant a lot more than what I really anticipated. So, I mean, it's a, it's a big accomplishment for sure, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. And I think the other thing that gets lost in it is you've, I will say this for you. I've, I've talked to you once. We talked at an AAU tournament a couple of weeks ago. We won't go into that story, but I felt <laughs> awful after I talked to you uh, at that AAU tournament. I, I did tell you about that. Yes, I did. You can. You want to tell that? I don't know if we want to tell that story on air. We'll talk about yeah, it yeah, off yeah, air. Yeah, 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 we'll yeah, talk yeah. about it off air. That was. I felt. I walked out of there feeling <laughs> awful. We'll just say that. Uh, but the other that's really cool is everybody I've talked to in Lexington about you has had nothing but incredible things to say. You have so many friends. You have so many friends, and you get to experience your senior year with them. I believe, was prom? Was prom this past weekend? Yep. Am right, I right on right that? down here, like, what, five minutes That's away? right, yeah. You were you were at the football stadium. Yes. You got to experience prom with all your friends that you've grown up with. How was that? Uh, it was a really fun experience, you know, just being able to spend the day with them. Uh, it was just, you know... We don't really have those moments like that no sure. more where everybody's around. So just being able to take that time away and, you know, just be able to bond with everybody. You know, one of the, probably one of the last times for a while because, you know, we all got different lives going on. We got different branches we're trying to get out to. So just being able to have that moment and share that with my friends is really special. You're not going to self-plug prom king? 
I mean, I wasn't going to, but now that you said Oh, he's a humble guy. Oh, oh yeah. Lamont's getting a humble guy. So you were prom king? Yes. Well, congratulations. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, let, let's talk about what you saw real quick this year. Um, South Carolina wins 26 games, goes to the NCAA tournament. What did you see from that particular team that, that you really liked, that, that kind of kept you interested? Uh, it was actually kind of similar to what I feel like we faced over at Lexington. I mean, it's definitely not the same the SEC in high school basketball, but uh, I feel like as a leader on the team, just talking to the team and being like, all right, we got to sit down and have this conversation. We have one end goal in mind. What are we going to do to get to it? And for just to see the guys buy in, I feel like I saw similarities in South Carolina's men's basketball program. You know, you just saw a bunch of guys that really wanted to work together and you know, do the best they could, go out there, win the SEC championships, uh, fell short of the regular season championship. But, you know, just have that one goal in mind. And for everybody to buy in, I feel like it was something special. How do you see yourself fitting in offensively with this team? Uh, I see myself fitting in pretty well. You know, we've got a lot of good pieces around us, uh, a couple returning pieces as well, especially Sam B. You know, he's had, he had a great uh, end of the year, you know, unfortunately starting off the year pretty rough. But... The way he finished it was really phenomenal, and I believe just plugging it with him and some of the other guys, it would be real smooth. You, my understanding is you have a good relationship with Gigi, with Gigi Jackson. I understand you know uh, Colin very well, Colin Murray Boyles. Um, how much did their decisions to stay home and, and play for Coach Paris and, and what you've seen, how much did that play on your decision? Uh, I played a good bit, honestly. You know, just I'm... Um, just watching Gigi come in, do what he did, and then be able to take that to the next level. You know, I got a chance to work out with him a couple months ago. Um, so just being able to talk with him about it, see how he felt, how what the process was like, uh, being here in Columbia and then taking his talents out to Memphis. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's kind of cool just to hear the experience from a firsthand point of view. But for him to be local, uh, pretty much following right behind his footsteps, being in the same school, so... I mean, that's a big part, but, you know, Colin as well, growing up, playing against each other, but, I mean, working out with each other and now being on the same team, and I think it's going to be a real special thing. How much did you lean on Gigi for recruiting advice? Did you ever talk to her? Was that just something that y'all are just friends and it was different conversations, or did you ever say, hey, here's what a coach told me. What do you think about this? Uh, it was definitely more of a friendship kind of thing. You know, I let him do his thing because, I mean, once you get here, it's a lot. I mean, I know, especially for him being the number one player in the class, he had a lot of pressure on him. So uh, I just really let him do his thing. You know, whenever he was there to talk, I was there to listen. But uh, we really just kept it friendly. And, you know, he did throw in a couple of recruiting statements telling me, you know, where to go, stay home every once in a while. But we usually just kept it cordial. <laughs> He's a different player, but at the same time, y'all are both lengthy players. How much do you see your game similar to his? Or, is, or do you see it as a completely different? Uh, I mean, he's definitely developed uh, even since he left here. But, you know, playing against him, especially in the high school uh, uh, years, I mean, you could kind of see a lot of similarities. We both like to play up and down pretty well. We both love to play off energy, We're both long. So just being able to kind of com like use those similarities to plug my game into what Coach Paris has already seen. I think it, it should really be a breeze, honestly. Yeah, and that was uh, part one of the conversation that Bill Gunther had with Cam Scott this morning after he made his announcement that he was committing to the University of South Carolina on the early game and the 8 o'clock hour. More of that conversation I'll have for you coming up next as uh, the halftime show rolls along. It is the 2 o'clock hour hitting the headlines. Again, the headline today is Cam Scott committing to the University of South Carolina. More of that conversation with our own Bill Gunser coming up next here on the Halftime Show on the game.
Welcome back in. It is the halftime show. Tyler Head along with you, along with Terry Ford. Going to jump back at the conversation uh, from earlier on this morning. Bill Gunter with new Gamecock men's basketball commitment, Cam Scott, as he was in studio making that commitment this morning, then hung around for a while, and uh, Bill got to ask him a number of questions. So we'll continue that conversation now as uh, Cam Scott uh, talking a little bit about his development as he comes in to being a South Carolina Gamecock. Absolutely. I mean, just coming in, being able to have probably one of the best strength and conditioning coaches in the country, uh, you know, the best coaching staff in the country, SEC coach of the year, you know, just being able to have these guys for the next couple of years just to help my development. I mean, it's it's going to be special. You know, I'm really excited for it. Uh, it's one of the biggest things I was looking for uh, when I reopened my recruitment, but I think I found it here, so I'm really excited for it. You got some things going on. You got to head up to, uh, I believe you said at Hampton, Virginia for yeah. an event? Yes. Uh, the Iverson Classic uh, will be May 4th in Hampton. So, yeah, it will be, it'll be a special time uh, being up there, but I'm excited for it. What are you looking forward to about being up there? Uh, really just being able to develop and learn, you know, nice competition. So I'm really excited for that part. But, you know, being around a lot of pros, uh, a lot of NBA vets, mm -hmm. that's something I've really been looking forward to. Uh, peeped into it last year. Just, just in case I had the opportunity to be invited to the game, and I actually was, so I'm grateful for that. I don't think I, I'm going to miss say this, and I don't mean in a bad way, but you really made a name for yourself at the Pangos camp this past year. What was that like? Because you were a good player. Everybody was talking about you. You had all the offers. It wasn't a matter of that. But when you went out there, you kind of exploded, and that's where everybody went, oh, He's a dude. He's a dude. I remember getting the reports back and talking to people that were out there, and, and they were sending me constant stuff because, because of where we both live and, and saying, have you seen this dude? Have you seen this guy? And what was that camp like? Because you're out there with the best of the best, and I, I think there was a couple reports that I believe they have an award similar. I forget if the exact name is Alpha, but you were the top person at the one of the elite camps in the country. Uh, it was real exciting, you know, just growing up, being a basketball guy, you stay, click on YouTube, watching highlights, you see the Pangos jerseys. So, mm -hmm. you know, that it was a really special event for me, being able to be invited to that as well. Uh, I feel like I just went out there and just played my heart out, honestly. Uh, you know, I had a couple of guys that I talked to uh, off the court um, that were a little higher up in the basketball world mm -hmm. that, you know, just keep telling me, keep going, you're looking great, keep going, you're doing good, keep going. So, you know, just keeping those guys in the back of my mind at all times now. I mean, seeing them around uh, every, every here and there, just seeing their faces, just knowing they're watching, and I just got to get better. Speaking of guys a little bit higher ranked than you, when did you first beat Dad and pick up outside? Dang, I, well, I can't even tell you. Was, <laughs> TVs might have been black and white back then. But. It's been a minute since he beat did he? Me. Did he not? Uh, did he not challenge you much? Did no, he know better now. <laughs> <laughs> Have you dunked on Dad? No, nah, he he's, he doesn't go for I that. I'll blame him for not doing that. <laughs> uh, better be happy I'm driving. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was just saying. <laughs> yeah, I need a hotel tonight. Let, <laughs> let's let Coach Pope get in here for a second uh, as he's been with you these last five years and, and really developed you. Coach, uh, for those listening, what is what is South Carolina getting from an on-the-court and off-the-court uh, experience here? I mean, he, he's a class act. Mom and dad are great people. Um, you know, it's been a tremendous opportunity over the past five years to grow from a 13-year-old kid. You know, I, I'll never forget he's playing in the district middle school football championship game. And, uh, you know, I brought mom and dad in and just explained to them, you know, the situation. Here's where we're going to put state championship trophy. Here's where we're going to put his, you know, uh, retire his number. As far as I'm concerned, nobody will wear 23 at Lexington uh, ever again. And then, you know, here's where we're going to put all his different actions accolades and they're looking at me like I'm insane uh you know because I was a uh, a 26 year old kid who had just got the job been there for less than three months and I understood the the talent and the ability this young man had but to his credit to mom and dad's credit to all the people that have been involved and you know obviously Cam for putting in the work to take expectation and act on it and improve it over you know not just a short time frame like you mentioned of being here for a year or two but doing it over half a decade um that's something that doesn't happen a lot that's something that doesn't come around a lot and now with with, with staying 
um, you know, within the state, staying with USC, um, and, you know, Coach Paris having this string of getting the number one players all the way back, you know, GG, CMB, Cam, and then Hayden next year, uh, you know, it's something special that Coach Paris is doing and his staff has put together over the past, you know, few years in recruiting. I forgot about Hayden. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I forgot about it. Real quick, right. you got a scouting report on, on Hayden because not a lot of people know much about him, uh, kind of a smaller school. Uh, yeah, Hayden uh, goes to Powdersville, I believe. Yep. Um, uh, yeah, he just won a state championship as well. Yep. So, yeah, he's a bigger body for sure, real athletic, physical type wing. It's, it's a guy to look forward to being able to be up here. You mentioned winning a state championship. Uh, Coach Pope brought up, and we were kind of trying to rack our brain, I'm sure some other uh, local people out there who, who followed uh, high school basketball very closely, prep basketball. We believe – Coach Pope believes, and I, I think I agree with him, you were the first ever two-time Gatorade player of the state to go to the university. Is that right, Coach? Am I, I mean, you and I were racking our brain trying to do that. I think the guys I played with, Roe Howe, I believe he was beaten out by Ed Scott in 99, right. and then Roe won in 2000. I don't, you mentioned Stanley Roberts yep. back in the 80s, but he went to LSU. Right. Not sure on BJ, BJ from Irmo there. Um, if he was a two-time, I know he won it once. I can't, and the the names escape me. But uh, you know, we were th- probably fortunate. Cam's junior year when uh, Gigi Jackson classed up and came to Carolina, so that, that opened up the path for Gatorade his junior year, and then this past season. But um, you know, I think Jamie Shaw at on three put it out the the list the other day. Um, but he's for sure, uh, you know. Um, uh, one of those special talents within the state. And, we're, you know, just super excited for Coach Paris and, you know, uh, the other coaches on staff and everybody involved that he's going to be a Gamecock. Obviously a, a huge day for you and the family as we kind of wrap things up. Uh, now you get to kind of – you mentioned Prom King, by the way. <laughs> Let's make sure we highlight that. You see this guy wandering around Lex and you Top can – Top of the resume. Hi, yeah, high-five him on uh, state championship, high-five him on Gatorade player of the year, high-five him on commitment to South Carolina, and – High five him on uh, uh, Prom King. But as you wrap things up now, your next month and a half, you mentioned you're going to Hampton for the Iverson Classic. Uh, you take time real quick to to be a high school senior? Just enjoy life? You got everything out of the way? Nah. Got to be in the gym at all times. Uh, that's, I mean, it's really been pushed into me now. Mm-hmm. And I feel like it's kind of, when I'm not in the gym, I get kind of bored, kind of lost in the world. So I might sleep all day, but... No, I just like being in the gym. Just like being in the yeah. gym. The three point shot is what everybody's gonna want to know about for you. That that's the biggest thing that I understand you've got to work on. How many threes do you put up a day? If you're if a younger kid is listening right now and you're giving out advice, what's the three point shot? How you gotta work on that? Um, well first off, you definitely gotta start with the form shots. Mm-hmm. You no. Know? I feel like Khadija was a lot part of this. You know, she taught me early how to really keep the form intact, especially Coach Pope too, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Apparently, he was a good shooter back in the day, so he, he, he did some right okay. things. Uh, it's amazing when we get older what we look like and what you think about how we are. I know you're looking at me like, nah. But you, you get to put that photo. I, I will say real quick, Coach, um, Dustin Curtis was in here with us earlier, yeah. uh, and I understood you had a really good slogan that I really liked where you all put your hand in the paint. Yeah. Uh, and and put it and said let's put our print next to theirs yep. and i thought that was really good um but so my picture is there yes. oh, it, I, is. it definitely is yeah I, I don't look sweaty but uh <laughs> I, it's because i only played a minute and a half of that game <laughs> you got the ring though that's i got, got the ring <laughs> final thoughts from you buddy got about 20 seconds uh, i'm just really excited just to be here honestly uh it's been an honor uh definitely a blessing and thank you to everybody for the support I think we're all excited to see what Cam Scott's going to be able to do as a South Carolina Gamecock again. His commitment coming earlier on this morning at 8 o'clock right here on the early game. And, uh, again, that was the conversation that he had with Bill Gunter after making that announcement earlier on uh, today here on our station. Uh, Check the calendar. It is April the 17th. That means it's the greatest day in the history of the world. With that coming up, it's the halftime show. Tyler Head and Terry Ford along with you on this Wednesday on the game.
All right, time for the greatest day in the history of the world, which today is April 17th. Oh, before we get to the greatest day in the history of the world, another reason why this is the greatest day in the history of the world, notice this really uh, really uh, cheesy radio transition I'm doing here, Tyler. Yes. Um, Jay Phillips will be, he, right now he's at Hilton Head. We confirm, can confirm he is there. And we can confirm at 4.15 he'll be talking to one of the guys who played today at the RBC, uh, South Carolina football coach Shane Beamer. We'll be on a 4.15 today. I wonder what he shot. Yeah, him and Lamont, I think, played together today. Okay. So uh, Shane will be on with Jay at 4.15. Hang out uh, and yap with Jay as he is <laughs> at Hilton Head where they are having the uh, heritage. But between the presser yesterday, talking with Jay today, or talking with Jay today, and Carolina calls tomorrow, they're going to be sick of hearing from Beamer this week. <laughs> Still and he's going to have a presser after the game on Saturday. He'll be sick of talking. He'll be like, oh, man, I can't wait to go home and not talk to anybody for at least a day. So that's coming up uh, on the postgame show with Jay and Elijah uh, here on the game. All right, greatest day in the history of the world, which is April 17th. On this day, and I always like to start to the uh, closest ones to us. Oh, I'm going to test. I'm going to test. Okay. It's time for NASCAR. Oh, all right, sweet. On this day in 2011, yeah, Jimmy Johnson wins the Aaron's 499. Yep. Who did he edge by about a foot? Because the official margin was 0 0.002 seconds, tied for the closest finish in NASCAR Sprint Cup history. Who did he edge out? Clint Boyer. Look at you. Oh, I, you can give you, show I can give you off. more details on this. It was actually a four-wide finish. You had Jimmy Johnson, Clint Boyer, Mark Martin, and Carl Edwards. <laughs> Four wide across the finish line. Look at you. That was the tandem racing era. It's almost sickening how much you know that stuff. By the way, just no, no, not to slip totally uh, on on, a, on another trail. What happened to Carl Edwards? Uh, so funny. He actually retired yeah, after but, losing the championship race in 2016. Yeah, and and he just disappeared. He did. Uh, Carl Edwards is always known as an interesting cat, different kind of guy. And uh, after he lost that championship race, he just kind of. Went off into the sunset. He farms in the Midwest now because he's from Missouri. Mm -hmm. um, he pops up occasionally. I saw him at Darlington when we were out there last year. But, yeah, he keeps pretty low profile. Doesn't have social media. Doesn't do a whole lot of interviews. Like, he just kind of faded into faded into the background, and I think he's okay with that. Yeah, very good. Maybe he's doing I remember backflip guy, too. So I, I was there for his first ever Bush Series win at Atlanta back in 05. So seeing the back backflip in person was pretty neat. All right. Um, on this day also... In 2001, some guy named Barry Bonds becomes a 17th major leaguer to hit his 500th home run. Bonds uh, hit that uh, against the Dodgers in a 3-2 win, of course. But is it still recognized? Yeah, of course, nothing Barry Bonds did is recognized. <laughs> and, uh, look, I, I understand. I get it. I do. And it's just the idea. My, I say this all the time about that era. Is to me... You don't know who was doing what, who wasn't doing what. You think you know what you don't know, right? right? You just don't know. You know if a guy tested positive, right? That's what you know. But you can't assume someone did it because all of a sudden they got bigger. Maybe they did. They probably did if they don't test dirty. Guess what? They well, didn't test dirty. You know, when he ballooned up and his head grew twice its size, yeah. you knew something was going we on. We know. When we are growing an arm out of your back, we get it. And here's the thing. Did Barry, if you ask me, did Barry Bonds do steroids? Absolutely. That there was that there was that book about him um, that was written it was a Game of Shadows or whatever it was. I think so. With all the stuff about Barry and the cream and the clear. Yeah, Barry Bonds did it. Yeah, Rafael Palmero did it. Yes, Roger Clemens did it. Yes, Alex Rodriguez did it. These guys did it. But I guess I look at it this way: that was an era where there were a lot of people doing it. You had no clue they were doing it. Sure. And there were people you thought were doing it that weren't doing it. I think if you, I think you should put them in the Hall of Fame. And if you want to talk about what they did was in the steroid era, that's fine. I'm, I'm much less crazy about steroids and others because here's, here's the reality of it. Major, Major League Baseball didn't stop it. The Fed stopped it by raiding Balco. Major League Baseball would have continued on that way. Because guess how much money they were making off the steroid era? Oh, a ton. It was very entertaining baseball, watching the home run chases and all that kind of stuff. Uh, they don't say chick di chicks dig the long ball for nothing. It's an entertaining game. I've said this out loud, and, and look, I'll say it. I always say it. I enjoyed the steroid era as a baseball fan. 
I did. It was fun. Now, how aware were you that they were on steroids yeah, at that I, point in time? I, once, I tell you, I didn't realize anything until Andr- Andrew, uh, Andrew Steen Dion with Mark McGuire. Uh-huh. And basically, a member of the media saw it in his locker. I mean, that's it. He wasn't hiding it. Sure. Because baseball players were doing all that stuff. Right. Yes, it was illegal, and it was banned in other sports, but it wasn't banned in baseball. Right. So Mark McGuire had Andro Steen Dion sitting there right in his locker, and some media guy went, what the hell is that? And that's where the whole thing started. Yeah, they were doing steroids. And Barry Bonds went from a skinny dude to yoked. It, see, seeing old, and again, I was this was before I was even born, but seeing videos of him when he was, when he was with the Pirates, yes. looking like a broomstick. Compared to what he was at the end of his career, it's not the same person. No, not at all. And and the shame of Barry Bonds, if you read a lot of the from the excerpts from the book and things of that nature, I mean, before Bonds roided allegedly, allegedly, he was already arguably the best player in the game. It sure. was him and Ken Griffey Jr. Sure. But Bonds was jealous of the attention that Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa got on the home run chase because that's Barry Bonds. Right. He's a miserable human being. And Bonds was jealous watching and said, oh, yeah, you, you watch me. Watch me on steroids. And, to, and Barry was right. He became a, a comic book superhero at the plate. Look at the numbers Barry Bonds put up. If you ever get bored, go to baseball reference. You'll go mother of God. Yeah. He walked a billion times. He hit home runs every five or six or seven at bats. He, he was hitting for a high average. He, he famously got walked with the bases loaded. By Buck Showalter in the Arizona-San Francisco game. So, yeah, Barry proved a point. Take the arguably the best player in the game and roid him. Yeah. And watch him go. And he becomes unstoppable. And he did. And Roger Clemens, all of a sudden, at age 40, is throwing 98 again. Right. So, look, I get it. And if you're, if you're someone who is traditional and all of that makes you want to throw up it, i understand it but my point is the league the game didn't want to stop it yeah the, the league was making money players were making money teams were making money everybody was making money off the steroid era the feds blew it sure. by coming in and, and raiding balco none of this would have changed without the fed so all of a sudden i don't like hypocrites yeah. all of a sudden all these hypocrites got religion and went after these players that they were basically doing the earmuffs from the movie old school on right that was my it, biggest problem with it was everybody was okay until the government busted balco well may, maybe we can create like a, a separate wing of the hall yeah. of fame that's just like you know on the other side of the bathroom for the steroid guys sure that i got no problem with that, that way they're still in but it's not like it's prestigious i guess i mean i look i'm a traditional guy for baseball and i get people get aggravated about this but here's my other part about it cheating is cheating sure baseball is built on cheating for the, the decades of the game go back to cork bats and doctored baseballs and and people the binoculars in the stands and baseball is almost proud of its cheating yeah well, some of it. Like, you're proud of spitballs. You're proud of Gaylord Perry, 45-year-old dude covered in Vaseline, doctor yeah. in baseballs. That's cute. They're just not proud of banging on trash cans. They're not ba- They're not proud of banging on trash cans. They're proud of guys who cork bats and think it's funny. Not proud of guys taking steroids. But it's, o- it's okay to steal signs. It's not okay to steal signs with electronics. So I guess all of that hypocritical stuff is why I don't get as geeked up about all this as some other people do. Right. Because everybody's looking for an edge in the game of baseball. So to me, have a steroid wing. Go ahead. Honor it, guys who all did that stuff. And what was it, that, that 10, 12-year it, uh, period? It, it's just a dimly lit part of the Hall of Fame. Yeah. You know, there's like caution tape in front of it. It's okay. And you talk about it in a very demeaning way when you're the tour guy. Like, over here is our steroid Hall of Fame. And you go like this, <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> whatever. I just, I, I, I just think that, again, the hypocrisy of the game is what gets me more than some of the other stuff. Sure. And also, I'll be honest with you. What if it was, what if it was Cal Ripken, one of the most likable guys? What if he was doing stuff? Ba- Barry Bonds was hated by everybody. Yeah, that, that's a different conversation. That might be a different conversation. Uh, 1994, Carl Lewis and the Santa Monica Track Club rewrote the record books, the 800-meter relay um, at the uh, Mount San Antonio College Relays. I mean, records were busted. Leroy Burrell, Carl Lewis. Remember, track and field went through a lot of this mm-hmm. with performance-enhancing drugs. Right. And then all that got banned, and you got all the all the uh, anti-doping and everything else that goes on in track and field, and a lot of those guys were part of getting banned from the sport as well. 
And finally, 1987, Julius Irving of the 76ers becomes the third player to score 30,000 points in his pro career. Irving's 38 points uh, helped him join Will Chamberlain and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in the 30,000-point club. You know, we haven't had a lot of Dr. J's on these greatest days no. in history compared to, like, Wilt and Wayne Gretzky. I love. I, I tell you what, Dr. J was something else, man. He had he had his big do, and he's there throwing down slam dunks. He was the first guy to take off from the free throw line, the slam dunk contest. Again, Doctor, if Dr. J was in the Sports Center era, oh, totally. How gigantic of a figure would Dr. J be en in enormous. the history of the game? Dr. J was something else, man. All right, that's a great day in the history of the world. Sponsored by 1 800 God Junk. We'll come back. Our firehouse subtext the hour at 803 on the halftime show. Terry Ford, Tyler Head on the game. Men's Clinic of South Carolina. Maybe you need some guidance, some help. Maybe your life has kind of gone sideways on you because you get brain fog or you can't sleep. You have a lack of drive in everything in your life. Maybe just maybe, you know, your gym workouts, you feel weaker for some reason, but you're busting your hump in the gym. Maybe you just can't recover from your workouts like you used to and you're stretching, you do everything you've always done, and you're just bleh. Could be low testosterone. If it is, or it could be, one way to find out. 803-875-MENS. Set an appointment at the Men's Clinic of South Carolina. Go in. It's a free confidential consultation with Dr. Dan and the staff. If they think you could have low T after you tell them your story, they'll do lab work. If it comes back low testosterone, they'll put you on a program that will make you feel like you again. It's personalized for you. Men's Clinic of South Carolina, 803-875-MENS.
All right, time for the firehouse subtext of the hour at 803 404 6100. What do you got there, Tyler Head? Uh, yeah, so going back to our last conversation, Eric weighs in and says the steroid era, era was the most exciting era of baseball. And I don't think uh, there's a whole lot of people that would disagree with that. It was definitely fun, high scoring games, lots of home runs. The yeah. home run chase of, was that 98? Yeah, it was yeah. Sammy and uh, Mark McGuire. That was a good 30 for 30. Yeah. And, and honestly, you know, Sosa made that fun because if he, at that point he was a very likable guy. Sure. And he was having fun. He brought the personality out of McGuire. Right. And they had fun together with him. Remember, the, they met on the field and were chest bumping each other, and the Maris family was there and all yeah. that. And, you know, by the time Bonds did it, because no one liked Bonds, you know, that was not a great fun time no. <laughs> watching Bonds. But, look, I, 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 get, I get people who get upset about it. I do. I understand it. I just, my thing is, in baseball, and I love baseball, but we sure. pick and choose what cheating we're okay with and what we're not. We celebrate certain cheating in the game, and then we get mad when technology takes over or science takes over. But the, the world advances in science and technology. You think in a sport where they're looking for every advantage to beat each other, no one's going to use science or technology? That's a good point. Of course they are. And I just get, I guess that's the thing that gets me, is we pick and choose which cheating makes us angry in baseball. And me, it's like cheating's cheating. And everybody's looking for an advantage, right? Right. Just like, you know, there were, there were Barry Bonds fans in San Francisco who took up for Barry Bonds. Just like there's Houston Astro fans taking up for the Astros. Of course. And, it's, again, it's just one of those things that makes my head hurt when it comes to all the cheating about the game, specifically the game of baseball. Most other sports, we don't get as fired up about stuff as we do what happens in baseball. Well, baseball is the one sport that is stuck to tradition more than any other, and that's been to its detriment in a lot of ways. I think so, too. I think, look, I like tradition in a lot of ways. I think we should hold on to certain traditions, but certain things you got to evolve, right? Uh -huh. You can't say stuck in this and, you always, and, and this is your answer. It's all the way we've always done it. Sometimes that's not the right answer. Right. <laughs> you know. And, and, yeah, the steroid era was fun. I mean, you had no lead was safe. You know, you had a lot of runs. You had pitchers throwing. All of a sudden, Eric Gagne goes from being a who to being the best closer in baseball because he went from throwing 92 to, like, 102. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, it was a fun era to watch in baseball. Uh, so we appreciate the firehouse subtext, the RA-203-404-6100. We appreciate that. Um so today, obviously, we didn't get a ton into the baseball today because we had the Cam Scott mm -hmm. announcement at 8 a.m. this morning. Um, we also obviously have spring football. You know, South Carolina, look, winning that game last night, it's one of these old sayings, right? Winnings, and, and it's one of those dopey ones, but in this one it almost works. Well, you could have lost it. It's very true. I mean, it's a one-run game. The Citadel had runners on the bases. They did. Um yeah, and able to get out of the jam there late in the game. And look, this is not a good Citadel team. They've lost 10 of their last 11 mm -hmm. coming in last night's game. That win doesn't bolster your resume for the postseason anymore. But as you said, it's better than losing. And if you lose that game, I mean, the Georgia Southern game was awful, right? Yeah, that, that was a low point. But if you lose that game last night, 5-4, to four, for an example, now you're going, well, last two midweeks, what'd you do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you lose some momentum from winning two out of three in Gainesville. Yeah, well, you lose momentum from what was a really good week overall. You, Yes, you lost the series to A&M, but you won on Sunday, beat North Carolina, and then you took two out of three in Gainesville, something you hadn't done in over mm -hmm. 10 years, by the way, and you're getting set for a mammoth of a team in Arkansas coming in here this weekend. You need all the positive momentum you can get. Yeah, and plus you used a bunch of uh, freshmen last night to help you get a win. Will Tippett continues hitting. It, the, the the sauce was just making him bat right-handed. Exactly. Turns out. That's it. So, at the end of the day, finding a way to grind out that W, even though it might not have been pretty, and you would hope you beat Citadel more easily. Look, again, you posted a win. You keep your momentum going. And now you uh, go cooking into a huge series against Arkansas. Yeah. You're uh, here at Founders. Yes. So, that's... We didn't get into a lot today about it, but... Well, you know where you can hear more about it? Carolina Calls tonight with Coach Kingston. 6 p.m. Uh, Mark Kingston will be talking a ton about it tonight. And again, tomorrow night at 6, Carolina Calls, the football version with Shane Beamer. And Shane Beamer today will be talking... Um, it'll be the golf version of Shane Beamer. Yes. No, at 4.15. Absolutely no questions about spring football whatsoever. No. Only golf related. Golf with Jay. Who I, is that the? I, uh, I I did see that he ran into Dude Perfect at the Masters. 
Are you really? aware of who Dude Perfect is? I've heard the name, yeah. Yeah, he took a picture with his son. I thought, thought that was kind of neat. <laughs> that is cool. So Shane will be on a 415 with Jay to uh, have a little fun and uh, talk some golf because he played today with Lamont Paris, from what yes. I heard. Which, by the way, despite the fact that it's 80 degrees, Lamont Paris was still wearing the quarter zip. Of course, he's Lamont Paris. Hey, never sleep. Did he have shorts on with the quarter zip? Uh, I think he was actually wearing long pants. So, yeah, like, okay. he's completely covered. Like, I, I, I respect committing to the bit, man. Me too, because you know what? 80 degrees. I know I know. one guy's not wearing a quarter zip. This guy. Yeah. <laughs> There's no um, way. Jay would be sweating profusely if he did. Jay, Jay remember, you remember uh, Frosty the Snowman when he's in the greenhouse? Yeah. That's Jay. Jay would be a puddle. Yeah, so Paris wearing long pants and the quarter zip on what looks like a very warm day out the RBC. Go get him. And Jay is out at the RBC. He'll be jumping in uh, with Elijah, who's here uh, in the studio, to do the postgame show. Again, Shane's going to hop on with, um, with who's that guy? Jay and Elijah at 415. Also, Jay will tell us what's going on at the Heritage. A week after the Masters, we'll see what's up there. And again, uh, the Cam Scott, we will get up. If you missed it earlier, we're going to do our but We've got it on the podcasting page already at 1075thegame.com. So you can check that out and our video stream as well.